All right, hello everybody. I would I would now like to call the October 27th, 2020 Longmont City Council regular session to order. It is the last city council meeting before the end of the world next Tuesday, however that may be. All right, can we please start with the roll call? Mayor Bagley, are you present? I am present, Thank Clerk you. Quintana. <laughs> council Member Christensen? Here. Council Member Doggo Faring? Here. Council Member Martin? Present. Council Member Peck? Here. Council Member Rodriguez? Here. Council Member Waters? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. Uh, Marsha, do you want to lead us in the pledge? No, but here I go. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to, to the republic for which it stands, which it stands one, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. All right. All right. Um, uh, just a quick reminder to the public, if you want to participate in tonight's uh, first call, public invited to be heard, you need to uh, call in when we throw up the slide to that toll free number, enter the meeting ID, and then uh, 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 we'll call you pursuant to your last four digits of your phone number. All right, let me have council back, please. All right, great. Um, let's go ahead. Uh, can I have an approval for the October 13th, 2020 regular session minutes? No, really, not so everyone wants. Okay, so doctor, I'll second it. All right, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. Aye. Aye. Wait, aye. Time, out. time out, time out. Council Member Hidalgo Ferry. Aye. I was saying aye. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought there was debate and I just moved too fast. Was anybody a nay? All right, so um, uh, the motion passes unanimously. All right, now it's time for a vendor re agenda revision, submission of documents, and motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future uh, agendas. I've got one item, and that is this Friday at three o'clock, we you all so graciously agreed to attend the Northern Arapahoe uh, meeting between us sister cities and the Northern Arapahoe, Arapahoe elected leadership. As of today, um, Governor Polis stated that we can have no more than 10. So unfortunately, that means me and Mayor Pro Tem will be attending along with the four uh, business council representatives, one member, Janice Redman, who's the sister city's chair, and then Harold, David Bell, and Carmen Rodriguez, which puts us at 10. Um, if anybody else would like to participate, we will make video access available so we can you know, put you on the screen and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, anybody want to yell at me for that? Council Member Christensen? Oh, you're on mute, Polly. Okay, <laughs> yes, I would like to uh, be in the video. Me too. Cool. I know that they would love to see you again, Polly, and especially Dr. Waters and everybody else who they've gotten to know. So if you want on the video, I know Dr. Waters has already been excused. He'll be out of town. Uh, Councilman Maria Lago Faring. Will you be sending a link to all of us? So if we want to, to join, or do we have to let you know now that we would like to be in attendance? Just, well, I assume Harold will send us a link. Hi, I'll send a link. I'll work with him tomorrow. But I'll send the link. My asynchronous day. So I don't have students at that time because they'll be working independently. So yeah, I'd like to be there. Via cool. video by, of course. Cool. All right. All right, Harold, I think that, that's all I have. Anybody else have anything else at this section of the program? All right, moving along. City manager's report, grid interactive efficiency buildings demonstration project. Harold, that's you. Well, no, I'm um, LPC. David, who's doing that? So, Harold, uh, we have Tim Ellis doing it. Tim, can you come on the line? Hey, can everyone see me? Yes. Excellent. Okay, are we ready to begin? Susan, you have my slides up? Give me one minute.
Don, I'm not seeing that one. Let me open up my um, my email real quick. Sorry, folks. Hey, Tim, while she's doing that, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Uh, my name is Tim Ellis. I'm the Renewable Energy Strategy Manager of, for the Energy Strategies and Solutions Group at LPC. Um, and I'm going to present tonight on a project that we're starting up called a grid, interact, grid Interactive Efficient Buildings Demonstration Project. It's a long name, um, but it's a real exciting project that we're partnering with Habitat for Humanity on. So no, I'm excited to, to tell you all about it. And, and thanks for having me on tonight. All right. Let's say we're really excited to have Tim on the team. So he joins our strategies team. And Tim has been with us a little over nine months and has a great uh, history of other projects with other organizations. So, uh, Tim, you have the floor. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, I think we got through this one. We're ready for the next one. So here's a slide you might have seen before. Uh, at LPC, we use this to indicate how a project supports all the various components of our integrated electric resource system and, and how the components play into meeting our 100% renewable energy goal. Next slide, please. The main focus for this project is to, oh, that's good right there, is to support and inform the beneficial electrification um, undertaking and also innovative and emerging technologies and determine how they're gonna play a role in meeting our, our renewable energy goal. Uh, the project's gonna also help support other components such as uh, the distributed energy resource component, built environment, and also the AMI piece. Next slide, please. So we're presenting this, this project tonight to council to seek your input and, and support. And here's the agenda. First, I'm gonna define what a grid interactive efficient building or GAB is. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about our partnership with Habitat and give an overview of the project. Then I'm gonna cover the benefits of the project and the concept to LPC, to Habitat and the participating homeowners, as well as the city. And finally, I'll wrap up with the next steps. Next slide, please. So a grid interactive efficient building um, are those that have an op optimized blend of energy efficiency, energy storage and renewable energy and load flexible technologies that, help, that are enabled through smart controls. So basically there are four components uh, to the concept. First, we need buildings that, that minimize energy consumption. So that's the efficient component. They allow for two-way communication between the customer and the grid. That's the connected piece. Uh, they also contain sensors and controls that allow the customer or LPC to monitor and manage loads. That's the smart piece and the flexible piece. Uh, so aggregated together, the, the, these ki kinds of buildings can act as a very important distributed energy resource um, on our grid. Next slide, please. So we're excited to partner with Habitat for Humanity on this project. Uh, they're constructing two housing projects in Longmont. Uh, two homes are going to be at two homes that are going to be in the project are at Marshall Place, and the remaining eight homes um, are going to be at Mountain Brook Development. The, the Marshall Place um, houses are already built, um, but the Mountain Brook Development has not started construction yet, and we're expecting, or they're expecting to complete it in early 2021. Uh, all of the homes are all electric. Uh, Habitat built the homes as all electric with the intent on saving costs and time and connecting with the gas company, so they didn't have to do that. And also by building these homes with minimal air leakage and efficient appliances, Habitat believes that the homeowner will actually have lower energy costs and greater comfort. So the project also aligns with Habitat's environmental <coughs> values by helping the city reduce peak energy loads and align with renewable energy generation. And it supports Habitat's goal of sustainable and transformative development in evaluating home energy consumption and using environmentally friendly grid interactive technology solutions. Next slide, please. There are several appliances that will be studied in this project. The first one on the upper left is called a mini split. It's a, a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning unit that's gonna be used at all 10 homes um, <clears throat> installed by, by Habitat. It's called a mini split and it's really an efficient way of, of performing HVAC in homes. Uh, we'll be monitoring the energy consumption of the units to determine the ability of, of perhaps having them included in, in future demand response or other distributed energy resource programs. And next, we'll also provide uh, that orange uh, piece of 
uh, device is called Home Energy Management System. It's a Sense Home Energy Management System, or HEMS. Um, it's going to enable us, LPC, um, and the homeowner to monitor, monitor energy consumption um, in real time. And from this information, the homeowners can make determinations on ways to save energy, and LPC and Habitat can use the data, which will be in 15-minute increments or perhaps less, to, to make determinations on, on future installations and programs for homes. Um, the homes at Marshall Place, the two homes that are already built, are also going to have an innovative solar installation. It's called Platio, and it's installed on the ground. You can see the picture here, the third one in. Uh, we'll be uploading and studying the energy generation from these two installations as well. And finally, the, the primary appliance for this project's analysis is the home's electric wa water heater. The control device will be connected to the water heaters and can be seen in that white circle. Um, that's that control device that we're going to be connected to. And it's not only going to monitor the activity of the water heater, but it's also, we're also going to be able to run grid interactive tests on the water heaters. And I'll discuss this further in an upcoming slide. Next slide, please. Or in the second part of this one. Our vendor is going to be providing us with an energy management platform that's going to uptake all of, upload all of the data from these various um, devices. It's called Grid Maestro. And um, our, our consultant is going to provide this platform and also ways that we can retrieve the consumption data from all the appliances. The main function of the platform is that it's, it's kind of like a machine learning program. It's like a Nest thermostat where it learns behaviors of, of homeowners or, and people in the home and how they heat and cool and use hot water. Um, and it learns as it goes. So it's, we can collect and analyze data. But the, the platform also gives us a four day forecast of expect, expected electric use from the hot water heaters. Um, and then the, the platform enab, um, configures different kinds of ways to test, test the uh, hot water heater. And I'm gonna talk about that as well. Next slide. Next slide. So overall, the project um, provides data to run analytics and develop energy management strategies for all partners. Um, LPC can use these grid interactive types of devices for load shifting, for load building, for demand response, for ancillary services, or to respond to unexpected grid emergency events. Uh, this include, includes things like peak electric induction, um, peak electric reduction that's shown in the graph in the right. The project also allows LPC staff to gain experience with grid interactive devices and platforms. The data collected will help Habitat assess energy efficiency measures that they installed in the home, such as tight building envelopes and efficient appliances. And they can also use the data to compare the, the efficiency of these homes with other similar homes. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the, the home, energy, home energy management system can allow homeowners to view their own energy usage and it's gonna give them some information so they can practice uh, energy savings behaviors. Next slide, please. So the total funding required for this project is a little over $16,000 and it's going to come from existing LPC allocated funding. We'll provide Habitat with $5,000. So that's gonna be $500 per home for each of the 10 participating homes. Our vendor for this project is named Shifted Energy, and they are going to need $11,000 of funding to cover costs such as the controllers, those home energy management systems, the energy management platform licensing, data integration to the platform, and training on the platform to us, as well as uh, some analysis and consulting fees. Next slide. So the project's going to provide benefits to the city to support in reaching our, our 2030 goal of 100% renewable energy. The generation of, of renewable energy and the consumption of energy in homes doesn't always align. So by putting programs like this into place that can manage home energy consumption and to align with renewable energy, energy production, we can help meet our goals. And also peak, peak energy is expensive. Uh, these programs, programs like this can allow us re to reduce peak electric consumption that and that can result in significant cost savings for the city and our residents. And uh, finally, the project su is supporting other studies and plans currently underway in the city, such as this, the distributed energy resource study that's being performed by Platte River Power Authority and the owner cities, including Walmart. Also, we have an electrification plan um, underway to help us determine under opportunities and costs of beneficial electrification. And finally, it supports our sustainability plan, which lays out the, the many ways that the city is working to reduce harmful emissions and, and help our citizens participate in the, in the healthy, sustainable Walmart. 
Next slide, please. The next steps for the project are Habitat needs to construct those remaining eight homes. Um, I'm giving the presentation to you now, so <laughs> that's a piece of it. Uh, so they're gonna be um, finishing those homes, as I mentioned, in early 2021. And during next year, LPC is gonna monitor the water heaters and mini splits, whole home consumption, as well as the solar production at these 10 homes. We're gonna run tests on the hot water heaters to determine the operation and functionality for, for grid services. And then we're gonna analyze the data to determine, to determine the opportunities for a full scale program in demand response or, or other DER project or program. We're also gonna be exploring partnership with a National Renewable Energy Laboratory down in Golden to use the data from this study to develop further um, programs and projects on water heaters or other grid interactive efficient building projects or, or programs. And then we're gonna be, be reporting back to city council on this project by mid next year. Next slide. That's it, thank you. Take any questions. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, uh, just for everybody else's information, Tim presented this um, at, to the Sustainability Board this week, so I've seen it again before, but it's it's still wonderful. Um, and this is a really, really terrific way to do this. First of all, partnering with Habitat for Humanity and, and uh, getting a small basis uh, of two experimental residential things so we can study residential and have a proof of concept. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, LPC is also exploring other potential uh, solar projects for city owned buildings. They're just doing a, an, an incredible job. I, I love LPC. Um, <laughs> anyway, I wanted to ask you about Marshall Place because I, I know that that was approved about uh, three years ago. Hasn't that been built yet? Yes, the two homes, uh, uh, the Habitat homes at Marshall are fully constructed. I believe either people are in them now or very soon. So yes, those are done. Okay, so, so you can already start working on monitoring those and... Right. Yeah, we're just wrapping up our agreements with our vendor and Habitat. So that's all in place and it's pretty much ready to go. Um, we can't really start up the full demonstration project till we have all of the houses built because we need to analyze the data all at the same time to, to have it really make sense. So so we're going to have to wait until those other homes are built, but certainly the, the, the um, devices will be in place and all ready. Thanks again for all you're doing. It's a terrific use of our resources, I think, to, to move us forward for better sustainability uh, and getting the grid, um, getting people to understand the grid and how useful this is to moving us forward to uh, lessening how much energy we use. Thank you. Councilor Peck, I see four fingers. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mayor Badley. Tim, this is excellent. I'm very excited that the city is uh, taking such a proactive role in getting us to, uh, our, uh, to our vision. But I was interested in, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you called it a platio. Is that what <laughs> it, that it looked like solar panels on a patio. That's right. It can be put anywhere on the ground. It, this I, that was just a picture from their website, but I believe, and it hasn't been. I don't know if it's been installed yet. It was close when I last spoke with Habitat a, last, a week or two ago. But yeah, I think they're putting it along a pathway or somewhere on the ground outside of the homes. So, um, won't that be pretty slick in the winter or when it rains? <laughs> see, yeah. see all over the place. Um, I, I asked them if they were shovel ready, on those and they said <laughs> it was fine. Exactly. I am very interested in, in how that works. It's a great idea. So thanks for being such, so um, just thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. On behalf of council, we want to thank you. Well done. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks very much. All right. Yep. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Tim, for your presentation. Thanks. All right, Harold, let's move on to the COVID-19 update. Yeah, and I have Rachel Art from the Boulder County Health. She's going to join us. Um, Susan, if you'll go ahead and get her slides, and um, we'll let Rachel take it away, and then I'll jump in with her. All right. 
Thanks, Harold. Can everyone hear me? All right, good evening and thanks, um, Harold and Council for having me back again to discuss everyone's favorite subject, COVID-19. Um, tonight, I'm giving the October 27th um, updates. You can go to the next slide. Uh, first, I'm just gonna go through the dial metrics, um, which we're using to determine um, which uh, level of stay at home we're in as the county. Uh, next slide, please. Um, sharing, unfortunately, some, some news that I was foreshadowing at the last council meeting. Uh, rates are continuing to increase across the entire metro region. And just actually from yesterday to today, our, uh, our case rate increased into the safer at home level three uh, range. So we're just over at 187.4 uh, cases per 100,000 for a two week cumulative incidence. And we are monitoring that closely. Next slide, please. Um, our positivity rate has increased about 0.7 um, over the last week um, from around 3%, 3.5% up to just over four. So that, um, that positivity rate is still good, putting us in the green and then next slide, please. Um, just wanted to share some uh, good news that our, our hospitalizations um, in Boulder County have been steady over the last 11 days, although we are seeing increases in hospitalizations across the entire region. So we would expect to see um, our numbers increasing soon in Boulder County. Next slide. Um, I did want to share just an update because we are still working in partnership with the University of Colorado and City of Boulder to monitor that 18 to 22 year old group and um, we have seen consistent testing the numbers of the 18 to 22 year olds um, have ticked up a tiny bit since last week but um, are still uh, right around that threshold for our baseline and the positivity rate is pretty consistent with the rest of the county. And so the decision was made this week and Harold can, um, can attest that because the entire region um, and every age group within Boulder County is seeing slight increases in our case rate, we decided that we will keep the 18 to 22 year old group at baseline with the rest of the county as we start to evaluate our policies and work on mitigation plans moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, so did wanna share some specific data around um, our incidence rates. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide, uh, the light blue represents cases that are associated with the University of Colorado, while the dark blue represents community members that have contracted COVID. And so as you can see, the numbers um, continue to may, remain very low for new cases among University of Colorado students in the last um, four days. In fact, there have been no confirmed cases in our database. Um, we have started to see an increase in cases at long-term care facilities, and we actually have 15 cases associated with those in the last two weeks. So that's, um, that is a change in, in, um, in where we're starting to see some disease. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to share this slide. I shared it at our last meeting, but wanted to share it this week because um, the case, the five day average number of new cases at 59.8 is higher than any point in um, in the response since uh, March or last February, except during our CU surge. So. Just wanted to share that our, our case uh, numbers are going up consistent with the rest of the region. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm just gonna go over a couple of slides um, by municipality and race and ethnicity because we've seen some shifts, some further shifts in the last two weeks. Next slide. So this graph shows the weekly number of COVID cases um, by municipality. And as you can see in the last week, a much larger portion of the new cases have been in Longmont. So in the last seven days, 32% um, of the cases have been in the city of Boulder and 43% in Longmont. 
Uh, next slide. Um, this is a really, really busy graph, but I'm just um, sharing it because Jeff does share this graph to show that um, the case rates, um, or the, sorry, the two week incidence rate is increasing among every single age group, as you can see. And we actually omitted the 18 to 22 year olds from this graph because there was such a huge um, spike that we wouldn't have been able to see the nuances among all of these age groups. Um, what's interesting to know is even though we've omitted 18 to 22 year olds that there are several other age groups with higher case rates that exceed that protect our neighbor threshold. Um, so um, th that would be the 25 um, to 34 year olds as well as the 35 to 44 year olds. Uh, next slide please. Um, so we do have really good reporting on race and ethnicity. Over 83% of cases have a known race and ethnicity. And I apologize that I wasn't able to get this specific slide for um, Longmont, but I did. I was able to um, take some notes off of the data points. And of the 347 cases within the last week, 62% or sorry, 62 of those cases are among Latinx Longmont residents. So that's um, almost 18% of the county's total cases among, um, among Latinx residents um, in Long of Longmont. And that is a disproportionate um, burden of cases um, on that community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this graph really sh just shows the shift in cases from uh, during the CU surge of white uh, non-Hispanic to now a larger portion of our cases um, from the Latinx uh, Hispanic uh, community. For the county as a whole, 46, over 46% of our cases within the last week, um, seven days have been among Hispanic and Latinx. Uh, next slide. And then I just wanted to share um, our overall um, testing numbers. So uh, final slide here, next. Um, so we have performed a lot of tests in Boulder County and thanks to CDPHE for allowing us to um, maintain that free testing site, which is currently located at the Stasio ball fields in uh, Boulder. Um, that has allowed us to keep um, our testing numbers up. However, even with um, the high number of tests that we're conducting, that positivity rate has increased quite a bit over the last month and a half, um, up to 4.4%. Uh, um, and then I'll just share um, some notes, some key takeaways that Jeff wanted me to share with everyone. So uh, again, we are seeing increasing cases statewide in most, um, in almost all age groups, the increases um, in cases in Boulder County are among all age groups, as you saw um, in the, the um, graph that I showed. Hospitalizations are increasing statewide. Um, so far, our mitigation plan with the University of Colorado has worked, um, especially with large gatherings. We're not seeing as many of those and the enforcement is working well. Um, we are concerned about fall and winter with more indoor gatherings and holiday um, gatherings, especially with Halloween coming up, um, as well as the mix of flu and COVID season. And Harold was so great last, uh, last council meeting that I attended to encourage everyone to get a flu shot if they have not already. Um, just also concerns over COVID-19 fatigue and a need to stay diligent. And then um, again, you know, just individual behaviors are really driving a lot of the increases that we're seeing. So small uh, gatherings among friends and family members are where we're starting to see um, a lot of the spread of disease. So just the need to social distance, reduce gatherings, wear masks and wash your hands. And I'm happy to take any questions if. Uh, anyone has any. And Harold, I didn't know if you wanted to talk at all about the um, the change in the gathering limits 
and if not, I can I can share that a little bit later after questions. Okay, so I'd like you to to change to help with that because sure. I still get the nuances. I did if I can share one thing before um, we get to the questions, um, I would appreciate that. I want to share my screen with you. So <clears throat> this is um, the overall snapshot that Rachel was showing you in terms of the COVID dial. And, so, and what's changed is a couple of things. So Logan and Adams actually, um, uh, Rachel, and if I'm not correct on this, but I think they were moved from level two to level three based on their numbers. And um, Harold, I just received a press release today that Denver and Arapahoe counties also moved to safer at home level three today. And I can see, yeah, you can see Denver barely, but it, they're not there yet. They're not updated. So what you're seeing is they are moving backwards in this data. Um, but the thing that also caught my attention is if you click on this, um, you can see the number of counties with um, the caution sign. Um, it says currently in mitigation. So when, when if you remember us talking about when you go into these, uh, when your cases increase and you see it, you have to put a mitigation plan in and then you have time. You can see a number of places that are now doing that or they're enforcing some stricter orders based on where, where they sit. And uh, if you get a chance, it's really good for council to go onto this um, COVID dial site. You can put it in Google and just CDPHE COVID dial and you can see what's happening uh, in the different communities. Um, part of that conversation is I have also, so Rachel and I have talked about this, um, the legal teams worked with, um, have talked about with Eugene and then Jeff and I have talked about it too, where we all are going to be getting together on Thursday to really really talk about what we're seeing in the community and how do we work collectively with Boulder County Health in terms of a very targeted outreach in, into communities in terms of trying to mitigate the growth in cases that we're seeing so we don't see ourselves slide like some of the other counties have slid into some of these other tiers. And so we're going to be doing a lot of work in partnership um, with Jeff and Rachel and, and the team from Boulder County Health. Thanks for that, Harold. I was just going to um, outline the new um, requirements for gatherings under 10 while, before we take questions, if that's okay with folks. So the state, um, as a reaction to these increased cases in the metro region, has actually changed the gatherings uh, of 10 for all um, groups within Safer at Home. So level one, two, and three Safer at Home. Um, all are limited to gatherings of 10 or less, but those gatherings now, regardless if they're indoors or outdoors, can only be among two households, according to the new state guidelines, because as I said earlier, and as Jeff shared on, these, on this key takeaway slide, we really are seeing a lot of spread among close friend groups and small family gatherings um, because people feel safe and comfortable with folks that they know and they're not masking and social distancing as much. So I just wanted to let folks know that that, um, that does apply to us uh, in Safer at Home level two. Let's go with Council Member Martin and then Council Member Christensen. So does this um, level of, of maximum level of 10 in a gathering uh, include in a house or in a backyard barbecue, or does it also apply to uh, ad hoc gatherings on public streets? Yes, it would apply to all um, private and public gatherings, although dining at a restaurant is excluded so our attorneys are asking a couple of questions about that yeah i think there's some there's a provision in the order that says unless there is another provision that allows it and so for religious institutions restaurants um, other locations um, there's a different guidance piece on that eugene can jump in if he's looked into it more in depth than, than I have. So Eugene, can you help answer that question? Yeah, Harold, you got the concept right. If there's other industry specific guidance for certain sizes, then that would prevail over 
the 10. The 10 is just uh, personal gatherings, either indoor, personal and private gatherings, indoor or outdoors. But industry specific guidance still um, could allow larger groups. And as a follow up, uh, is there going to be a change in enforcement? Because before it was really that there isn't any. I'm going to let Harold answer that one. On, on, on which piece? For the maximum of 10 for a public gathering. So we're still working on that. So I know um, we've had some calls um, recently from one. We have sent folks out to those locations and worked with them. I know there's going to be a, a, another conversation on that piece in terms of the how. Right now, um, based on what I have, all the jurisdictions are, are still approaching the educational component on this. Um, it was only, uh, in terms of what I saw from other jurisdictions, it was only the 18 to 22 where there was a different approach on that one based on those orders, um, and that was in Boulder. Um, so I know Rob is working with um, the other public safety groups in terms of conversations on that as we speak. Uh, Council Member Christensen, I'm in Doc Waters. Um, um, Rachel, I'm wondering if um, there is any breakdown on um, data between the genders, um, because um, women also are disproportionately involved in the in caretaking and uh, service industries. And I would expect to see a higher rate of infection. I'm just curious whether anybody thought to break it down by gender. You know, we don't have any of our data slides broken down by gender. And I can't believe that I never thought that that was strange before, but I'll definitely look into it and um, make sure that I communicate that with Harold if we have, have it easily accessible and if not, um, I could put in a data request. However, we are in a bit of a surge. So um, CDPHE actually has been giving us some of the cases back that we sent to them for help. So our epidemiologists are, are quite busy right now, but I will ask because that is a very interesting question and could help us in our mitigation plans as Harold referenced. So thank you for bringing that up. Dr. Waters. Uh, Rachel, two questions for you, and Harold, I have one question for you. Um, <clears throat> among the, the, the metrics that you share each week and that we've looked at on the dial, um, are some of those more animating or activating for, for county health or any public health department than others? And I, the reason I ask is that I've, I've been challenged by at least one a resident um, uh, who, who makes the case via email that what we have is a case Pandemic, not a pandemic, right? You have all these cases, but look, you don't see the hospitalization, you don't see death rates, et cetera, um, that reflect uh, uh, a problem of sufficient magnitude for us to be mobilizing. So um, from a county health perspective, uh, which of those metrics are most activating or animating for you? I'll, we'll start there. Yeah. Um I mean, I would say that all of them are important to us because those of those three dial metrics, because those are the criteria that the state is using. And I will say that we have been closely scrutinizing the ho how the hospitalization is calculated. So it only um, the hospital rates um, for cases are only calculated using a couple of hospitals within Boulder County. And um, as you may have heard in any of the governor's updates that our hospitalizations are actually the highest that they've been since May. And so if you look at that, um, that uh, map that I put up and only one county was in red, it's strange that only one county would be in red when hospitalizations are going up across the board. So our total number of hospitalizations in Boulder County is in the 40s and that's higher um, by at least 10 or 15 since the last time that I spoke with you all. So it's a matter of how the state is pulling that data um, as well as where the folks are residing of how it's calculated. And so 
hospitalizations are a really um, important factor, but the case um, the case rates are important because they're kind of a pre-indicator to hospitalizations. And so, so, so if I can add to her explanation too, um, I think we're at 47. I got those numbers from Dan yeah. earlier today. Um, so we're at 47 total hospitalizations in Boulder County, 11 in Longmont, and those are COVID cases. So when we see hospitalization, I don't th think of it as a rate. Maybe it is. Maybe there's a calculus of a rate, but we see numbers, right? Numbers of hospitalizations. When that number seems to be growing disproportionately large or faster than the say the percentage of infection, right? From 2.4 to 4.4, is that an indication of Maybe this goes to some of council member Christensen's question, the demographics, you, you mentioned more Latinx community members um, uh, in the infection rate. Is, is that a reflection of the demographics of who's being infected because there's a faster rate of increase of hospitalizations relative to, to case increases and um, infection rates? It, yeah, if we actually look back to one of the slides that I presented on, you can see that um, even though um, Latin X represent, it, this is county data, 13.8% of the total county population, and uh, they represent, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to read this, it's small on my screen, um, they represent 43% of um, folks that have ever been hospitalized for COVID. Um, so it's actually much higher proportionality even to those that, that have been effect, um, infected with the disease. Yeah, just just uh, as you look at the, as you comment on the, the, the uh, size of the, the font and the numbers on your screen, that's the way they look to us each week too, pretty small. Intimidating, but just uh, small in terms of uh, size of the font. Uh, Harold, the one question for you is, um, you know, we had the presentation on the testing of wastewater. Uh, we were going to collaborate with other municipalities. It's my recollection. We were submitting a proposal. What's the status of that? Because that's the early indicator, right, of what we might see coming over the next two weeks uh, for those communities that are actively testing wastewater. And I think so the university, university is testing wastewater. Where, where are we with that? So they're, they're running this test right now. I think the key piece is um, based on the amount of data they've collected in terms of then taking that and, and looking at the, the, um, the cases and how they're moving in. We are just now, I think, at the point in looking at some of those charts where we, there's actually um, data that we can use to start trying to figure out a correlation on this. Dale and I actually had this conversation um, earlier today about um, he's reached out to Roberto and John Gage to start looking at how we can do a regression analysis on those two data points so that you can start seeing a correlation. But we've, we're just now actually collecting enough data to really start doing that. Well, that would, if we have those data and, you, and you're able to do that analysis given what we're seeing in terms of increasing other rates, uh, that, that would be the, that would be the, the animating metric I would think for us in terms of the urgency we would need to be taking to whatever outreach we're going to do, education we're going to do with the community. And I'll, I'll, I'll mute myself. Bill, did I miss anything? Uh -oh, we lost no, Bill. Carol, I, I think you hit the topic. I think the, uh, the fact is we're just now getting sufficient data uh, to be able to analyze it. Um, but in looking at it, um, there does appear to be some trends that are showing. And um, so council member Waters, I, I do believe at some point, um, it, it will prove to be a leading indicator that we're gonna be able to uh, report. Yeah, council thanks. member, sorry, oh, go I ahead, was, Rachel. No, go ahead, I was Rachel. just gonna thank um, council member Waters because I think that'll be important data to include in the mitigation planning that we'll be working on. So thanks for bringing that up. I'm going to make a note of it. All right, Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Um, I have actually a few questions. And one of them, I guess, will go back to the um, 
you know, what council member Christensen and Waters have brought up about um, the uh, looking at the disproportionality among um, we are Latinx community or, or maybe looking at women and um, you know, the, that change or that, you know, is it disproportionate? Let's delve deeper in the data, but also too, do you have any kind of um, breakdown on professions of individuals who are um, either they, who test positive or end up hospitalized? Because I'm kind of thinking, you know, access to um, days off to be able to take care of themselves, access to um, um, healthcare. So looking at, you know, it kind of depends on profession too, and and that except, you know, just their exposure rate. So maybe the meat meat um, packing plant and and different places like that, or places where they don't have um, offer benefits, health insurance. So they're not able to to go in immediately. Yeah, I think that um, you know our epidemiologists do ask about um, place of employment as part of their case investigation, so that we can determine um, if it was a workplace exposure. Mm -hmm. um, there have been several business outbreaks that are all posted on CDPG's website. So that would be if there are two. Um, or more employees of a business that are COVID positive um, and this, the business does have to do mitigation there. And um, I, I would just say that I agree with you that there are a lot of disparities that exist before the pandemic and now um, lead to some of the outcomes that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. We have hired a bilingual bicultural resource coordinator and the new database that has been launched in the last couple of weeks, Dr. Justina, does allow for a better categorization of resource needs so that we can start to share those with community organizations, cultural brokers, um, to make sure that those issues are addressed okay. um, as, as well as we can. Okay. And then in the past, I had seen in one of the presentations, there was a slide that had, when you looked at the positive rates, the number of um, ones that were community spread and another one that was individual, uh, person to person. And I haven't seen any slides or any kind of, um, even when I look on the website. Um, I can try to find that one from you. We do have widespread community spread. So um, I, I'm not sure if we're actually categorizing it okay. that way anymore um, mm -hmm. versus a close um, contact. But I'll, I'll follow up on that one and get, make sure that if we do have it, I will mm -hmm. get it to you. Um, yeah, and then the other one in going back to the um, gathering guidelines, the gathering of 10 or less. And you said mm -hmm. it was, if I heard you correctly, it was two households, no more than two households. Is that correct? So That's then, correct. In looking at, you know, there were special provisions for restaurants and certain businesses, but what about daycares, schools, or even those outside rallies? What would that do for those types of gathering? I mean, they're all close together. Some are not, a lot are not wearing masks. Yeah, there are specific guidelines for, um, for outdoor gatherings and Currently we're in safer at home, we're still in safer at home level two. And if those are permitted uh, registered events, outdoor events, you can have up to 175 people attend those. Um, it's in appendix I of the public health, the state public health order, um, like a football game, for example, like watching sports. So. I guess I would defer to Eugene because I'm not an attorney, but that's my understanding or Harold. Yeah, so, so, sorry, go ahead. So, it, okay, so we, can, we, we can't have Thanksgiving, but we can go to a protest or a football game. That's what I'm hearing. Because those events, you have to be socially distanced and there has to be mask wearing and you can have Thanksgiving with one other household. And even if I were to want to have two friends over that are from different households, that is currently not permitted. And 
but I could also go out to eat with those friends. So that is the, You're yeah, mute. <laughs> I think we know what he, yeah. I think we know what he's saying. <laughs> uh, those are the very, I mean, the, again, I kind of, what I talked about with my team today as we were getting this, there are a lot of questions coming back because there's, we just don't understand and, um, Council Member Hidalgo Ferrying, to your question, those were things we were asking today because of this reference to unless there's industry specific or other guidance in these orders. And so it gets pretty specific to what we're talking about, um, where you have to go searching for that. So do you understand the frustration and why there's so much with all the confusion and how it's okay in this respect, but not okay in this respect. And, you know, so we're getting all these questions. There's a lot of confusion and a lot of disbelief. Like there's, it, I think it builds a lot of distrust. So I guess I would like to know who are the powers that be that we could really, as a council, go forward and say, you know, why? <laughs> Where, you know, give us the answer. So I know it's not on, on you both. You didn't set the policy. You didn't set these criteria. Who can we go to? The gut is governor. Governor Pol it's Governor Polis and and kind of Mayor Hancock. Those two seem to be driving it. Am I wrong, Harold? My six foot ruler, I can go over there. Well, and in, in CDPHE, I mean, because they're the ones that set the dial. And so when the governor issues, I mean, you'll see this when they, when they say, "Here's what we're going to do." It actually comes out in a health order via CDPHE. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some of the cases, the questions that you all have brought up. So you know how it works. We port those into, in our case, Eugene and uh, uh, Liz. They then are in an attorney call with Trina and Kate and other mm -hmm. attorneys. They then take those questions and then they push them into CDPHE. And then we, we start trying to get the answers to it. Okay, thanks. All right, Council Member Martin. Um, yes, this is just, I, I think, just a note for Rachel, because um, you kind of skipped over something. Um, you said the event has to be permitted and mask wearing is required. And I think uh, Council Member Hidalgo Faring and I were both referring to events that are not permitted and where masks are not worn. Um, so what's the deal with those? I will defer to Harold because that sounds like it could be an, an, a potential enforcement issue. So I don't know what category those fall into because specifically you're talking about the activities that are probably on Main Street. And I don't know, um, and that'll be something I'll have to push into Eugene to figure out, does that fall into a different category? And if it does, what is the specific guidance on those categories and what does that mean? Um, because I don't know if there's another offshoot in that world. So we'll, what we can tell you is, we'll, let me work that with Eugene and, the, and Liz and to make sure we're in the right category because that's a challenge for us right now is it's, it's not, um, how do I say this? There's so many different specific requirements for different types of activities. So the example, in this 10 person rule is, um, as Rachel pointed out, athletic kind of events. There are specific guidance for that, even for youth athletics. And, and so what you would think, well, 10, but you can do this. Those are the issues everyone's still struggling with right now. Well, we'll do the best we can. Councilor Peck. As I mute, thank you, Mayor Bagley. So um, I have some of the same questions, but I do have um, what I would like to staff to consider when you mentioned that the 18 year olds are going to be, um, Boulder County is going to have enforcement over 18 year old, 18 to 22 year old uh, gathering. And we haven't, uh, we haven't addressed that yet. Did I understand that correctly? No, there was very specific orders for 18 to 22 year olds in the city of Boulder based on the outbreaks that they were seeing and what the 
and, and what that looked like. So if, if you looked at some of the health orders and, and orders that um, Boulder, the city of Boulder issued in conjunction with um, Boulder County Health, there were even a number of specific locations that were put in those orders. And then the gathering piece was very specific to 18 to 22 year olds within Boulder. And, and so there were specific orders gov surrounding that population in Boulder. So my, my uh, concern is that, or, or my suggestion is that I, I personally think that if we're going to have an enforcement like that in one city, it should be countywide. To assume that 18 to 20 year olds are not going to want to gather in mass groups, they're gonna find a place. It, it is just easier if we adopt the same enforcement rules. That's just my suggestion. But going back to the gatherings, uh, and this goes to enforcement also, just a couple of weeks ago at Sandstone Ranch, there, uh, that baseball game, there were a lot more than 175 people sitting on those bleachers without masks together. So um, once again, I feel that we need a county uh, enforcement account so that we all agree, we all know what, what everybody is doing. It doesn't make any sense to me that in Louisville, you can go and have 300 people, but over here we can only have 175 or it, it just makes sense that we all agree in Boulder County on what our enforcement regulations are and that we abide by those. Um, so that's my two cents worth. All right, does she have another hand? All right. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Holy crap, got the Rona. All right, Rachel, thank you very much for your time tonight. Harold, anything else? Um, I just wanted to um, turn it over to Jim. We just sold some bonds and we normally update you all on our bond sale and city manager comments, Jim. Thank you, Harold. Um, Mayor Bagley, members of council, I'm Jim Golden, Chief Financial Officer. So we did hold the sale of the open space uh, refunding and improvement bonds this morning. We only got two bids, which is unusual. We typically will receive anywhere from maybe six to 10 bids in one of our bond sales, but it's a very heavy week for, for bond act, municipal bond activity. A lot of entities want to go to the market before the election. And so we only received two bids, um, but uh, we did receive a, a low bid of 1.88% uh, true interest costs, which was uh, in excess of what we're, where we were um, mapping out our, our estimates. So that's much to our advantage. It's from Huntington Securities. Uh, there is, uh, we basically are selling 17.8 million of bonds with a $2.8 million premium. It's generating four and a half million dollars of new dollars for uh, open space projects. And then it's refunding the 2010 bond issues that were outstanding. Um, the total debt service for open space bonds now is being reduced at about $380,000 per year from what it was before the sale uh, over the course of the remaining outstanding years through 2033. That is, is a total savings of just below $5 million. But we are also adding an extra year to the uh, the new issue, 2034, which is the final year of the tax. And so that's an additional 2.3 or so million dollars of debt. Um, and we are adding our reserve monies that we had for the prior bond issues towards this as well. So overall, the net present value savings out of this bond issue for the city is $2.28 million. So it'll be closing um, in mid-November. That's all I had, unless you had any questions about that. Nope. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. All right, Harold, anything else? Nope, that's it. All right, let's go on to, we're going to take a quick three-minute break while we get ready and load up first call public invited to be heard.
Hi, folks. We just let in a bunch of callers. We are still on break. We will call you by the last three digits of your phone number when we're ready to begin. We'll go down the list. And when we call out your number, be prepared to unmute yourself. Please make sure that you've muted the live stream or we'll, it'll be a little confusing because there is a delay. Thanks so much and hang on. We'll get started here shortly. Give us just a few minutes or a few more seconds while the screen disappears from our live stream and we're still admitting some folks. So for the callers that just entered the meeting, uh, you are muted. You will be asked to unmute one at a time. We will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Please make sure that you have uh, muted the live stream because there is a delay and you will not hear us uh, call on you. And if you do not unmute when we call on you, we will try a couple times and move on to the next caller. We will come back to you again. All right, Mayor, I believe we're ready to begin. All right, how many people are in the queue for first call public invited to be heard? 13 to my count. All right, let's go ahead and leave it open until after the first caller is finished with their three minutes and then we'll close it up. Sound good? Sounds awesome. Our first right. caller, Mayor, their last number, last three digits of their phone number is 236. 236, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Are you there? Can you hear us? I think that's me. That is you. We hear you. Can you please state your name? Okay, I would. Can, can okay, you... Sally Sprague. Thank you. You have three minutes. All right, I'm calling in favor of the Bond Farm co-housing uh, community proposal. Now, I've been interested in co-housing for many years since living in co-op houses during graduate school. When I returned to Colorado this time, I looked at several co-housing opportunities along the Front Range and was disappointed in what was available then. Bond Farm came along when I was getting ready to retire and relocate to Longmont. Unlike the other communities with which I was familiar, Bond Farm had amenities and plans that matched my abilities and interests. The CSA opportunity for contributing to the building and living unit layouts and the structures of the farm portion with the CSA. I have been in three CSAs and I'm really excited to have one so close at hand. The inclusion of an elevator for upper level units takes care of my lousy knee, which prevented me from buying into one co-housing setting. As a single person whose last family members left Colorado a few years ago, Finding another community nearby is very important to me. I am committed to staying in Colorado, but want more connection with people who share interest in productive land use, like the farm, green buildings, all the structural elements of the project, and knowing and caring for neighbors. Co-housing and Bond Farm in particular is a great option for me, and I hope that the current folks at the Bond Farm neighborhood understand that being part of the hood is important for me. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the next caller. Caller 347, I'm gonna ask you to unmute.
347. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Am I unmuted? Yes, we hear you. Please state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. This is Mary Lynn. I live on Atwood Street in Longmont, and I'm calling to weigh in about the um, smart metering uh, issues, which are before the city. The city is at this time looking at some very exciting um, opportunities to um, conserve energy, uh, interesting projects uh, like that presented by Tim Ellen, uh, Tim Ellis um, in this meeting. However, um, I'm urging the city to not rush towards the use of um, uh, radio wave smart meters. They are not necessary for the city to have on every house or even most houses. Statistically speaking, a city the size of Longmont uh, only needs something of the order of 405 or so smart meters that could be voluntarily chosen by houses in order to be able to, uh, if they were distributed through the city randomly, um, that's all that's needed in order to be able to determine uh, usage and make most of the decisions that the city is looking to make in terms of uh, regulating and um, deciding how much energy should be available at any one time. And uh, smart meters are unsafe in terms of data privacy. Uh, they are unsafe in terms of uh, EMF uh, radio wave frequency radiation. And they're unsafe in that they're not grounded and they catch fire easily uh, due to power surges. So please look at alternative and innovative ways to um, to regulate the um, energy usage in the city and utility usage without mandating the smart meters, um, EMF emitting, radio wave emitting smart meters on every home. Thank you. All right, our next caller, your phone number ends in 499. 499. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? We sure can. You, okay. you, you may begin. This is Doe Kelly of Barberry Drive. This is part two of my public comments from last week's meeting where I shared my canary in the coal mine story of becoming electrosensitive and having injury confirmed by a brain mapping therapist I was seeing. I hope you will see the connection between what I shared last week about my own story of microwave injury with what I share from this article. Last Tuesday, I was flabbergasted to see an online article titled, Suspected Culprit Emerges in Mystery Havana Syndrome. Reports suggest Russia is behind alleged attacks on U.S. diplomats around the world. As you may recall from 60 Minutes in the News, this Mystery Havana Syndrome describes multiple U.S. diplomatic and other agents who are apparently targeted with something that heretofore has received much speculation as to how multiple personnel in many locations in the world receive dramatically similar neurological injuries, so much so that U.S. personnel were evacuated and offices closed in certain countries. The article, dated October 20th, 2020, distills information taken from investigative journalism seen in GQ and the New York Times. I paraphrase from the article. Remember Havana syndrome, the term often used to describe the weird, inexplicable ailments that began affecting U.S. diplomats in Cuba in recent years? Two investigative pieces by the New York Times and GQ seek to shed more light on what's happening, both making clear that these incidents have been happening around the world. GQ suggests that consensus is settling on some kind of directed energy weapon, possibly using microwaves. Russia has a history with such weapons, both stories note. Forbes spins off the time story by explaining a minuscule but rapid rise in tissue temperature resulting from the absorption of pulsed microwave energy creates a thermoelastic expansion of brain matter, an expert tells Forbes, which likens the result to an acoustic shock wave in the brain. There's more to the story, but suffice to say, the description of microwaves causing an acoustic shock wave in the brain indeed did capture my attention considering that I described a part of my own injury as 
10,000 miniature jackhammers going off in my ears. So I leave you tonight with these thoughts to ponder about wireless smart meters. Wireless biomicrowaves is not sustainable for living beings. You heard Dr. Scott Cunningham quote several scientific studies on adverse effects of electromagnetic radiation last week. There's a lot of other hard science out there if you look or if you ask that cast shadows of doubt over the science being settled on smart meters potential adverse health effects. The real science knows this. And the health effects presenter from last week, Bill Hyde, although well-intended, was not an expert in this field. Longmont deserves to hear from one who is. Thank you very much for your time. All right, next caller. All right, our next caller, your phone number ends in 525. I'm going to ask you to unmute. 525. Caller 525. There you are. Yeah, hi. Hello. Please hi. This is a. Mm, go ahead. Please state your name and your address for the record. You have three minutes. Yeah, this is Laurel Ritchie. I'm a practicing realtor in Longmont, Colorado at 512 Fourth Avenue. I'm calling for a number of reasons today. First of all, I am a member of Bond Farm and I wanted to call in support of that. I think it's a very progressive, great idea for Longmont and a super use of that particular property. Um, in, co-housing communities typically do hold their value very well. It is a high quality housing meant to be very green. Um, it supports multi-generational living. So people get a great education from one another and care from each other for each other in a way that they don't in normal housing. Uh, and I just think in general, this is a super bonus for Longmont. So I really wanted to support that. Um, this, along with many other things that Longmont has done, are very progressive, um, such as when our forefathers provided you know, plenty of water for us in the community, for instance, having next light, we're having, um, we have landlord training, landlord trainings once a month, and we have great mediation services. So there's much that Longmont is doing very well, and this is definitely one of them. Um, I did, though, want to talk about some of the recent things that have come up, such as um, Airbnbs. Airbnbs were approved about, I don't know, 19, 20 months ago. People have invested their money into these homes, and now the carpet is being pulled out from under them, uh, possibly. And I know that some people on the council do not like Airbnbs, and I feel like this is just chipping away at them over time. And next, it'll be not just the standalone ones, but also the ones that are in homes. So I really uh, don't approve of this. I think it's very detrimental to say that a business is allowed, people invest their money, and then the carpet's pulled out from under them. Um, in addition, talking about rental licensing, we are having a lot of issues because of the state is actually coming down quite hard on landlords lately. There are some great rules that should be in place, but other people are pressing for ones that are excessive. Um, in my own business, I've seen two of my investors move their money out of the state. They have actively sold off all their properties. One has taken their money to Wyoming and one has taken it to Washington. And just today, I received an email from another investor of mine who sent me the um, a link to the thing about the rental licensing being questioned. And she is now talking about moving her money to Wyoming and um, Montana. And I find this very upsetting. Obviously, it's my own business. But in general, we are pushing businesses out of this state, ones that have been great businesses. And our landlords in general here in Longmont are great. We do have services for them. And the state also has laws that cover livable habitat, you know, habitable living. Um, so to talk about rental licensing in Longmont, I would hope that it's being driven, if it's going to continue, being driven by some sort of necessity that there's actually a problem being seen. Um, otherwise, it just seems like a big waste of time. And it's a message to our landlords that this is not a friendly place for them to be. So I really hope that you will consider this and um, look at what the rules are already in place. I strongly recommend that you maybe bring in to talk to um, the lawyer who often speaks to the Landlord Symposium. Her name is Deborah Wilson. 
She's with Springman, Braidman, sorry, Springman, Braden, Wilson, and Pontius. And her number is 303-685-4633. She talks to us regularly. She's very knowledgeable about it. She's very, very involved on Capitol Hill with the legality of rental licensing. And I just hope that before you dive into this and send the message to our landlords that it's going to be a hostile environment here that you would um, get an education on what's already in place because it certainly does seem sufficient. All right, and that's about much. it. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Next. Our next caller, your phone number ends in the numbers 983. I'm going to ask you to unmute 983. There you are. This is 983. Hi. Hi. My name is Darlene. My name is Darlene O'Shani and I live in Longmont in an RV and I have a uh, comment here. RV ownership has grown from 7.9 million in 2005 to over 9 million today. 1 million Americans live in RVs full time. Well, meet the modern nomads. We are independent, self-sufficient, and we are human beings that God put here just like everyone. In August 2017, you changed the law for RVs to park in the street for 48 hours and then move 600 feet. So I bought my RV in 2017 and playing by the rules, knowingly, I could park in the street legally. I know of three RVers that had to move out of Cottonwood. They are now in the streets for whatever reason. There is about 800, there is, their rent is about 850 plus utilities there. Now you are trying to change the law so we can't park in the street. Well, if you should be able to grandfather those of us who are already parked in the street, stay if we want to. Some of us are not eligible for your housing programs, or do we want to be? As for me, I became homeless in 2013, and living with a friend and in my own my van, I bought an RV, and it is part of my recovery from homelessness until I find a better solution to better living, whatever that may be. I have to take care of my family first. My three sons have no work or place to go. Besides, I help a lot of people out here, homeless and people on my job. Being a bus driver, I think that I am a first responder in putting myself in danger to COVID-19. And I think you should wait to change the RV parking laws until after COVID-19 because a lot of RVers do not know what you are doing because they do not have the means to go online and speak to you or see council meetings. And somehow they should be notified of your intent to change the law and time to consider it and respond. Furthermore, I would like to say, like to bring to your attention, while I was driving and working around Longmont last week, I drive about 40 hours. There were a lot of newer RVs driving and parking here around Longmont. So I suspect they're coming out of the mountains and evacuations from the fire. Also, I am getting reports that people who are evacuees from the fire are in their cars and have no place to go. With all due respect, now is not the time for no parking laws. Uh, thank you very much. And I don't envy your job. All right, thank you very much. All right, our next caller, your phone number ends in 065. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Zero six five, there you are. Okay, hi, it's Abby. Can you hear me? We can. Please state your okay. name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Oh, sure. Okay, Abby Driscoll at 1304 Lupine Court. I'm here tonight as board chair for Sustainable Resilient Longmont. And um, just wanted to make sure the council knows, you know, we've been working on 
a renewable energy campaign since 2017. And um, wanted to make sure the council knows that tonight, there's a, and this week rather, there's an um, RP going forward to the Power Authority Board. And um, um, it gets us to 90% renewable energy by 2030. So we're happy to see that. Um, we're also happy that the IRP in its um, current form um, commit, recommits to the resource diversification policy and the goal of 100% renewable er energy by 2030. Um, and um, specifically, the resolution states that PRPA, quote, will continue to proactively pursue a 100% non-carbon energy mix by 2030. Uh, seeking innovative solutions that will, will would enable Pat River to provide reliable and financially sustainable electric service to its um, owner communities without new fossil fuel resources. Um, if possible, while using P2 as the planning, budgetary, and rate-making baseline to advance Pat River's progress towards this goal. So um, I also just want to make sure everyone knows that before um, this, uh, this uh, natural gas that plant that uh, is in the current IRP would be built. There'll be two more uh, IRPs before 2030, the next one being in 2024. And my hope is that, you know, things will keep moving in the right direction as far as technology and market forces and everything you're hearing about that um, Longmont Power is doing on distributed energy as well. Um, so, you know, with climate change upon us, uh, affecting Longmont as well as obviously nearby communities in Boulder and Larimer counties, we have to act as swiftly as possible to avert a climate crisis. And we hope that future movement that favors price points for solar storage combined with technological advances in the renewable energy sector and innovations like distributed energy will continue to support Longmont's transition to 100% renewable by 2030, if not before. So, and we do oppose any new investment in new fossil fuel infrastructure, including natural gas. And we hope that Mayor Bagley and David Hornbacker will, um, as our representatives to PRPA, will help us, um, you know, keep moving in the right direction. So, thanks so much. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, caller. All right, our next caller. Your phone number ends in 119. 119, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. This is Karen Dyke. I'm at 708 Hayden Court. Mayor Bagley and council members. Almost four years, a small group of us got together to talk about renewable energy. We looked at the Sierra Club program for 100, uh, ready for 100 commitments, and how could we build this type of programs as a grassroots community effort in Longmont. We were aware of the contributions of our municipal power company to our local air pollution and also global warming. We found that others in Longmont were also very interested and wanted to help. We had a mantra that if they could get to 100% commitment in Pueblo, we could get to 100% commitment in Longmont. We were pleased to get a proclamation by Mayor Bagley in January of 2018, followed by a resolution stating commitment to 100% renewable energy from the city council. Longmont then served as an inspiration to other cities and the mantra there became, if Longmont can do it, we can do it. SRL, Sustainable Resilient Longmont, worked closely with a larger group to encourage our power provider to close the rawhide coal plant and replace it with renewable energy. Thursday, PRPA will vote on an IRP. An IRP outlines a plan for power generation, future generation. Our group and other local groups worked hard to get a commitment to 100% renewable energy in this IRP. We weren't able to get that pure commitment. However, the resolution that will be voted on states that PRPA will continue to work towards 100% renewable energy and that they will review the need to build a fossil fuel plant to generate electricity in a new IRP within the next four years. While this isn't a total win, the resolution gives us room to hope 
that the fossil fuel plant will never be built. My hope is that the $163 million being set aside for a fossil fuel plant is instead spent for storage to support a 100% renewable energy future. Innovation should make this possible. I urge Council to continue to follow PRPA's action and work towards a more sustainable future. As we look at the clear evidence that the climate is changed with all the fires this month, we all need to be thinking about how we can move away from fossil fuels. I was very impressed with the president, uh, a presentation on Habitat Homes tonight. And it uh, gives me great hope that uh, Longmont will continue to be a leader. Thank you so much. You heard it here first. Karen Dyke was very impressed with the pre and president. I'm sure she, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Karen. I'm kidding. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, go with next caller. All right, the next caller, your phone number ends in 131. I'm going to ask you to unmute. 131, there you are. Can you hear us? Hi. hi. Yeah, I can. Um, hi, my name is Nettie Penman, and I live at 609 Collier Street. And um, I'm calling in support of the Bond Farm Community Project. And I am a member of uh, the Bond Farm community. And I was attracted to Bond Farm because it's a community built around common interests. And our community, for our community, those interests are agriculture, our gardening, and art. And um, I myself am an artist, and I've worked as an as a artist, more or less hobbyist, for the last 50 years in clay. And over those years, I've gained a lot of knowledge about materials and techniques, and I've accumulated a lot of tools and equipment, which I would hate to abandon when it's time for me to downsize. And um, fortunately, when I found out about Bon Farm and realized that uh, one of the interests is supporting artists and creativity, and Part of the plan for Bond Farm is a lot of uh, maker space. And um, so um, because we'll have multiple shared workspaces and art rooms, it's going to be really, it's going to really be an encouraging environment for creativity. And we have lots of spaces planned for displaying artwork. And we want to include not only the barn, Bond Farm members, but you know the whole Bond Farm neighborhood and the city. And we have planned spaces for displaying artwork and for making artwork. Um, so within Bond Farm, if you're a member, you're encouraged to sign up for one or two teams. And I'm a member of the art team, and the art team's been actively involved for a few months in planning uh, a large gate area that will be a central focal point of the um, project and hopefully be a um, very welcoming focal point and express the creativity of the artists who live there and, and are designing it and will be um, cooperatively actually building it together. Um, so um, as, a, as a senior who's lived in Boulder County since 1972, um, I'm looking forward to uh, having Bond Farm um, be an opportunity for me to live with other, among other artists and, and share the knowledge that I've gained and um, participate in lots of activities in a supportive community. So um, I, encur I encourage everyone to find out about Von Farm. It's such a unique development and is going to be a great resource for our, for our community. So thanks. Thank you. Next, how many more do we have to go? Three? Give me just a second. Two, three, four, five. So the okay. next caller, your phone number ends in 332. I'm going to ask you to unmute. 332, are you there? 
Hello. 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 Yeah. Uh, thank you all. I'm just calling uh, as a can, yes for the bond farm concept plan amendment. Ma'am. And can, just in. Yes. Can you, oh, my name. State, yes. Uh -huh. State your name and address for the record. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Annie Brooke. Uh, 4425 Driftwood Place, Boulder, Colorado, 80301. And I am one of the invested members in the bond farm and very uh, much grateful for the way that City of Longmont has worked in cooperation and making sure that the bond farm really follows through with the city ordinances. And we've done a terrific job in designing a concept design that also bridges some of the social invitation to people outside of the exact membership. So people can join as affiliate members, can use some of the resources that will be on site at the property. So I'm just calling in to uh, ask for that ordinance approval for the concept plan amendment. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next. Our next caller, your phone number ends in 418. 418, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Are you there? Yes, Ken. Am I coming through? Yes, you are, sir. Oh, okay. Last time, at, last week, it just went kapoof on me because I was trying to do it with one of those gear things. Um, uh, the reason I'm... Uh, I'm calling is that, Sir, can, sir uh, before you begin, yes. can you please state your name and address for the record? Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. Name is Stanley Toll, T O L L E. Uh, I'm a longtime resident of uh, the city of Lon Lonmont. And uh, I'm calling about the um, proposed RV ordinance. And the reason I've sent the council. Um, you know, a week ago, a no notice, and then I've actually sent a um, something that I'm going to be filing with the court if the city doesn't uh, follow the uh, you know, the Colorado Open Meeting uh, requirements. Um, the reason I'm uh, making this filing this complaint is that. The people who are living in RVs really haven't been involved. You know, the city hasn't made the effort to involve these people. And the Zoom meetings themselves are really an emergency measure uh, put in to deal with COVID. And the main thing is, is that people that are living in RVs, this is really beyond their ability to be able to participate in this. And an open meeting is more than just being able to see what the city people are doing. You you show up at a meeting, you make contacts with people, you organize, and this open meeting statute that was put in by initiative in this state is so the people of this can get involved and participate in making their own laws and with with their city representatives. And this is totally being excluded out. And so I have sent you, uh, hopefully it's gotten to you, I've sent it to each one of your email address, something that if we don't pause this and do this RV, we just did an RV ordinance. And a lot of people, like they said, are were dependent on it. And so we haven't even had a chance to see if the old one's going to work. And it's actually illegal to rush through with something like this and something like Zoom, where you don't really have people that are being impacted by this having a chance to participate in it. And it's actually illegal. And that if this city is insistent, and you should read the thing that I just sent you, the law is very plain that if you have a meeting that doesn't meet the open meeting requirements, anything that's done there is no and void. All right. And one that, of the that, things. That, 
I've given you a little oh, 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 about three and a okay. half minutes, so Dan, but we're going to have I to think end I've, I've said it. All right. Thank you, buddy. All right. Next caller. All right. Our next caller, your phone number ends in 633. I'm going to ask you to unmute. 633. Can you hear us? Your phone number ends in 633. There you are. Can you hear us? Oh, hey. Hello? Sorry. Uh, yes, hello? We hear you. You may begin. Hi, Please state. Is... Yep, go ahead. My name is Shaquille Dalal. I live at 609 Perry Street. I'm calling to ask counsel to ask with Karen deliberation and to stand up for equal protection under the law. Tonight is the first reading of an ordinance which seeks to essentially criminalize, criminalize living in an RV. During the October 6th meeting of the Longmont City Council, many members of council expressed concern that the ordinance would be used against their constituents who permanently store RVs or other vehicles in the public right of way. During that discussion, Jeff Satter told members of council that he and his officers would ensure that the law would only be enforced against those living in their RVs and that he would protect landowners from the consequences of violating that law. I was very disappointed in the members of council who allowed that to sail by without comment. Whether we believe their behavior makes them nuisances or not, and whether they are there by choice or due to economic circumstance, people who live in RVs are still people. It is wrong for the city council to write a law whose text says it should be enforced against everyone, but to inform, only enforce it against some people. In the same way that it was wrong under Jim Crow to ensure that only people of color had to take a poll test, even though that law was written to be race neutral. I understand why council feels that the only practical solution to the problem of illegal waste dumping by those living in RVs is to outlaw living in them. But writing a law which appears to apply to everyone and then asking the Longmont police with a wink and a nod to only enforce that law against people considered undesirable falls far short of the standard a community which claims to have a, po a progressive police report should set po police force should set for itself. All right, thanks, Shaquille. All right, is that it for the callers? No, Mayor, we have two more. I'm going to call again on 633. It appears another caller jumped in. So I'm going to ask 633. Right, let's, let's make sure we lock up this and no more callers. So when we're on first call, public invited to be heard. If they're not on the list, they don't get in. So right. And so when you see someone, now, Mayor, when you see someone now in the waiting list, it's because uh -huh. after they speak, if they don't hang up, I put them back in the waiting list. In the, Got in it. The waiting okay. List. I just yeah. want to make sure that we don't have perpetual. Nope. Calls. We're good. All right, cool. Got got it covered there for you. Um, caller 633, let's try that again. Do you hear us? I'm going to ask you to unmute. Caller 633. Your area code is 724. The last three digits are 633. Susan, I think we just heard from 633. No, it was 635 that jumped in, actually. Uh, Council Member Waters. All right, I'm going to move to 926. 926, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi there. Uh, my name is Ben Sargent. I live at 744 Atwood, uh, Old Town East Side. And um, I was uh, attended the study session last week on the smart meter issue. Uh, and I have a few comments and observations on that. Um, I have a, a friend of a number of years who was a, a, an RF engineer for the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, in the uh, NASA group and um, sustained a neurological injury uh, on, a, on the job uh, and had to retire. And he spent the years since then um, researching uh, at what the RF exposure that he gets uh, in his neighborhood. And um, he states categorically that the smart meters are, are not safe uh, and that people need to, uh, you know, get to independent research on that and not 
listen to the industry uh, people who um, are either uh, are just uh, not not actually using safe science methods, um, but uh, obviously financially motivated. Um, and so, as, as an example of that, um, I was shocked uh, during the study session that the ex so-called expert from Boulder County had some very uh, questionable data that he shared. Um, and he, uh, uh, Councilwoman Martin pointed out that uh, the figures that he was giving for RF uh, uh, coming off of a smart meter didn't seem to include <laughs> the transceiver what, or the, you know, the signal generator but was just sort of the base level equipment uh, without full, you know, you know, not as it's actually configured uh, when it's put on a home. And so um, I thought that that was uh, really strange. Like, where did he get that slide? Uh, obviously, from somebody in the industry, I, I don't think he would have come up with those figures himself, uh, but it, it shows poor research. And um, that really concerned me um, I get my uh, exercise walking around the neighborhoods, um, and um, nobody brought up the fact that that, he, that it's not a matter of you know how much uh, RF is coming off of a single <laughs> meter. Uh, you're, you're being bathed from all directions, uh, and we have already have uh, you know too many uh, cell phone towers, very dangerous, uh, all the way back. Uh, 3G is dangerous, 4G is dangerous, 5G is, uh, you know, even more dangerous, uh, and that's coming in. Um, we have all kinds of Wi-Fi, so the electronic smog uh, in Longmont is very uh, concerning. And, um, you know, right. in terms of smart meters, think about... Sir, there's, uh, no, there's, there's like no, the sir, there's no good time to catch off, but we're well over three minutes. But okay. we're gonna have, all right, well, invite, we invite you back, though. Thank you. All, all right. right. We're going to go back to that last caller, see if they can pick up. All right. If they don't pick up within about 15 seconds, um, we're going to end it. Whoops. I put the wrong one in the waiting room. Let's do this again. Caller 633, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Caller 633, are you there? Hello. Hello. Can, can you hear me? We sure can. We can hear you. Oh, good. Thank you. I, I got in. Okay. <laughs> so should I go ahead? Yes. Please state your name and address right, for the record. You. And you My have name, three minutes. Thank you. All right. My name is Marianne Riga. I've called before. Um, I live at 70 21st Avenue. And um, I'm talking again about... Um, people with disabilities and I'm calling it disability awareness because um, it's important for the general public to know to be aware of people with disabilities and how the word the, what the word disability actually means an inability to function in a physically or mentally normal way and normal meaning um, the way a regular person would be able to function. It doesn't mean that they're abnormal mentally or anything like that. So um, the ability to do that um, can be can affect a person's uh, ability to get around, ability to communicate. And so um, because of that, um, my disability uh, prevents me from walking in a normal way at a normal rate because of injuries to my feet and legs. So um, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to say this because I wrote a lot of notes <laughs> to share. But um, the thing is, if the general public is more aware of this, and education is needed, I believe, for people in whatever way the education can occur, for those who are motivated to learn and for those who can be educated in ways in which they know when running a business, they need to be aware that the disabled person does have certain needs and be aware that they are not to be um, – able to do something that they're not able to do. Once again, the word disability means inability to function or walk or do things in a quote normal way. So in other words, when one goes into a restaurant and one has a walker like I do, 
and the host or hostess comes over and says, I'm going to take your walker now and put it in a corner. That happens a lot in restaurants, especially when I'm alone. So for me to speak up for myself, it's difficult. So I do it the best I can, and I say I need my walker with me. So um, when the general public and business people are aware of this, then they are more amenable to that person's needs as a disabled person. So to, to be nice and take the walker and and put it in a corner may, may seem like a nice thing to do. However, that person, that's their amenity and they need it with them, usually. Usually they do, sometimes they don't. But if they do need it with them, then the host or hostess and the manager uh, need to have a seat for that person where they can have their walker nearby. That's one example of the general public having an awareness of a disabled person's needs and really um, meeting those needs and being amenable to them and having good customers who are disabled people. I think that's all I'm going to say right now because there's much more to say, but um, education is needed of the general public when one when a disabled person is out alone, especially without a helper. Um, that disabled person has to speak for themselves and it can be difficult when the general public is not aware that that disabled person has special needs. Right, Thanks great. for listening. Thanks, Marianne. All, All right. right. You're welcome. Con- Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, that concludes First Call Public Invited to be Heard. Let's move on to the consent agenda. Don, can you read that for us? Good evening, Mayor. Um, just going to remind you that item 9I was p- removed from the agenda by staff at a late date or at a late hour, so I will not read that into the record. I'll skip that one. So item 9A is Ordinance 2020-51, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities of the City of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2020. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10th, 2020. 9B is Ordinance 2020-52, a bill for an ordinance adopting the budget for the City of Longmont for the year 2021. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10th, 2020. 9C is Ordinance 2020-53, a bill for an ordinance making additional making appropriations for the expenses and liabilities of the City of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2021. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10th, 2020. 9D is Ordinance 2020-54, a bill for an ordinance amending section 3.04.885 of the Longmont Municipal Code, adopting an amendment to the employee contribution requirement of the City of Longmont General Employees Retirement Plan. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10, 2020. 9E is Ordinance 2020-55, a bill for an ordinance authorizing a farmland lease agreement between the City of Longmont and Joseph M. Docheff on the French property. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10, 2020. 9F is Ordinance 2020-56, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of -of right-of-way within the villas at Ute Creek Subdivision, generally located north of 17th Avenue and west of Pay Street. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10, 2020. 9G is Ordinance 2020-57, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 11 of the Longmont Municipal Code on vehicles abandoned, kept on public property, or junked. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10, 2020. 9H is Ordinance 2020-58, a bill for an administrative ordinance approving the purchase option agreement to convey a parcel of city-owned land located at 2000 Sunset Way to Sunset Element, LLC. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10, 2020. 9J is Resolution 2020-106, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Colorado State University for receiving loaned material for an upcoming museum exhibit. 9K is Resolution 2020-107, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the application for change of water rights and confirming the city's conditional appropriation of water rights in connection with a change of shares in the Bonus Ditch Company. 9L is Resolution 2020-108, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the United States Geological Survey to provide stream flow gauges on the Boulder, Left Hand, and St. Vrain Creeks. 9M is Resolution 2020-109, a resolution of the Longmont City Council supporting the grant application to the Department of Local Affairs to reduce the carbon footprint of Longmont's wastewater treatment plant. And 9N is Approve One Capital Improvement Program Amendment. All right, do I have a motion and or uh, removal of these items? Um, Can I get the council back, please? And then uh, Councilmember Christensen. 
Hi, thank you. Um, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to pull item A and item G for discussion. All right, can I please see the entire screen? I need that back. Um, Mayor, it may be on your end. You may need to change your view in the upper right corner. All right, I am seeing two seconds. Why am I only seeing eight people? Um, Voted gallery view at the top. Yeah, that's what I'm at. There's only um, the six of you all on camera now. Okay, all right, all right. That, that would be why. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I just get so scared when it's just us. I feel so lonely. All right. Anybody else want to pull anything? Councilmember Peck? Uh, I don't want to pull anything. I was going to make a motion. So. Go for it. Joan, it's yours. Okay. I move that we uh, move the consent agenda minus items A and G. I will take I will, I will take that as a motion to include also I, which the staff also uh, asked to remove. Um, it's been moved oh, and second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, aye. all opposed say nay. All right, this consent agenda is accepted and passed unanimously. All right, moving on to ordinances on second reading and public hearings on any matter. We're gonna go ahead and take a two minute break. And if you are waiting to call in for any of the second uh, uh, ordinances on second reading, um, you will need to call in now. So we will be back in two minutes. So stay close so we can blaze through this. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so folks, we've let in a few callers for the public invited to be heard. Um, sorry, the public hearing section of our meeting. We're going to leave you on mute. And as each of these ordinances come up for their public hearing, we will ask you to raise your virtual hand by uh, pressing star nine on your phone when we read out the particular ordinance. And that will give us a clue that you wanna speak on that particular item. 
And if we don't hear from you, we will leave you in the queue for the next item and so forth. If you don't raise your hand during any of them, we'll check in with you at the end of the public hearing. So again, raise your hand star nine as we call out each of the different ordinances. How many, how many people are in the queue? Mayor, we have three at this point that I've let right. in. Perfect, can I get the screen back? Yes. All right, who are we missing? So give us like 20 uh, seconds Susie. and wait for the screen there she to is. leave. What you, Susie, what you eating? Susie, is it better than my stuff? I need to know. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I've been what trying. Is it? It's my dinner. I've been trying to eat it since 5 30. I, I just want to know what it is. Chicken. What kind I, of chicken? Uh, grilled. All right, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'm a little jealous. I like eating. I like eating during these Zoom meetings. I don't know why. Maybe because they're boring in my kitchen. All right, let's go ahead and uh, start with 10A, Ordinance 2020-44, Bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for the expenses and liabilities of the City of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2020. Um, staff, there's no report. Are there any questions from Council? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing is there anyone who would like to speak on this item is there anybody raising their hand susan mayor i'm not seeing anyone yet all right um, perfect we'll we'll go ahead and close the public hearing if somebody pops in we'll revisit the issue can we have a motion for ordinance 2020-44 i will move ordinance 2020-44 do i have a second 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 it's been moved by myself, seconded by Council Member Waters. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed aye. say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. 10B, Ordinance 2020-45, a bill for an ordinance fixing and levying taxes upon the real and personal property within the city of Longmont for the year 2020 to pay budgeted city expenses for the 2021 fiscal year. Um, there's no staff report. Is there, uh, Council Member Peck? Um, thank you. I just want to clarify that we are not raising taxes. We're fixing the taxes uh, that we've already levied last year. Is that correct? That's correct. No change in the tax rate. Thank you, Jim. All right. All right With that, oh, we need let's to- go, Let's go ahead and open it for, I'll call on you as soon as we have the public hearing, Council okay, Member. thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and open it for- uh, public hearing is there anyone who hits star nine that would like to address this issue i do not see anyone at this point mayor all right we'll go ahead and close the the public hearing Councilmember peck would you like to make a motion i do i uh move ordinance 2020-45 second all right it's been moved by Councilmember peck seconded by council member was it martin I know Dr. Waters did, but I think it was Councilmember Martin as well. So we'll go with Councilmember Martin. And uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Item 10C, Ordinance 2020-46, a bill for an ordinance fixing and levying tax upon the real and personal property with the Longmont Downtown Development District for the year 2020 to pay budgeted expenses of the Longmont Downtown Development Authority for the 2021 fiscal year. We are fixing, not raising taxes. Same question, same answer, I presume, uh, to Councilmember Peck. All right, um, there's no staff report. Councilmember Martin, do you have questions? Um, no, I no question. I was going to make a motion, but I forgot you have yep, to. Let's go ahead. That's all right. Let's go ahead and open the public hearing. If you would like to speak on this matter, go ahead and hit star nine to raise your hand, please. Anybody? Not seeing anyone, Mayor. All right. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Council Mayor Martin, would you like to make a motion? Yeah, I move adoption. All right. I'll second that. Uh, ordinance 2020-46 has been moved by Council Mayor Martin, seconded by myself. Uh, seeing no further discussion or debate, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ordinance 2020-46 passes unanimously. 
Moving on to 10D, Ordinance 2020-47, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of a pedestrian trail easement associated with the 110 Emory Minor subdivision plat and site plan generally located south of 2nd Avenue and east of Emory Street. All right, there's no staff report. Let's go ahead and open it for public hearing. Hit star nine if this is the issue that you'd like to speak on, please. Mayor, I'm not seeing anyone respond. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing on ordinance 2020-47. Does anyone have a motion? Councilmember Christensen? I, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you were gonna make a motion. I saw some fingers. I'll move ordinance 2020-47. Second. I'll second. Right, move up. Oh, okay, it's been moved by, Count, by Mayor Bagley and seconded by uh, uh, Dr. Waters. Um, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, Ordinance 2020-47 passes unanimously. 10E, Ordinance 2020-48, a bill for an ordinance amending section 15.03.080 of the Longmont Municipal Code on Zoning Districts, Measurements and Exceptions. Is there a staff report on this, Harold? No. I'm assuming no. No. All right, let's go ahead. And, all right, that's what I thought, but just making sure. Let's go ahead and uh, uh, open the, first, uh, the public uh, hearing on this matter. If you're here to talk about the uh, municipal code on zoning districts, go ahead and hit star nine. I am not seeing anyone respond. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing on ordinance 2020-48. Do we have a motion from our council member? We move approval of ordinance 2020-48. Second. All right, ordinance 2020-48 has been moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by Councilman Martin. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. I think I saw Councilman Christensen's lips move, so we're gonna count it as an aye. All right, so that passes unanimously. All right, 10F, ordinance 2020-49. <laughs> A bill for an ordinance approving the concept plan amendment for the bond farm rezoning and annexation agreement located at 1313 Spruce Street. I'm thinking that this is star nine. Time to hit star nine, folks, if you want to talk about the bond uh, concept plan. We'll go ahead and read your last four digits and we will hear what you have to say. All right, I'm going to ask 073 to unmute yourself. Are you there? 073. Caller that phone that has a phone number that ends in 073. Can you unmute yourself? All right, let's go to the next one. We'll All right. The, the next caller, your phone number ends in three up oh, zero seven three. Are you there? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Are you can you hear me? Yes. Are you here to speak on you just muted yourself? Let's try that again. Caller zero. There you are. Okay, you can hear me. My name is Stephen Rutherford. And I'm soon to uh, be moving to Longmont. My daughter and granddaughters live in Longmont. And my wife and I have been um, uh, involved in the Bond Farm project for now four years. It's been a long wait, but I, I want you to know we're, we're incredibly excited about being able to uh, be a part of that community. Excited because it's, it's uh, in, near the center of town. Um, we look forward to being able to get ourselves around by bicycle, uh, visit our, our daughter and granddaughters on, on the, the bike path that goes right through Bond Farm. Uh, my wife is also an artist and is really looking forward to being a part of the art community that's going to be there. And as well, the, the two acre farm, so that we're looking forward to being a part of that effort uh, to grow our own food and be um, 
uh, sustainable in that way. So I, I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of what I think will be a real shining star for the town of Longmont, soon to be my home. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Thank you. The next caller, your phone number ends in 350. I'm going to ask you to unmute 350. Caller 350. I'm going to move on to the next caller. Caller 418. Nope, there's 350. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. This is. I'm Jean Jasmine. I reside at 210 and a half Lincoln Street in Longmont. And um, I'm a member of the Bond Farm co-housing community and am really excited to be with um, people who are uh, in the uh, healthy aging community. Um, there are so many ways in which we can support each other. And I'm going to... Um, decrease can you hear me yes we can okay um in healthy aging there are two basic um things that we need to consider both the need to receive and the need to give with bond farm co-housing community we can receive um by sharing the work of home maintenance and operations things like uh, appliances and technology. We can share the uh, pet care for neighbors uh, when needed. We can share the use of cars and shopping trips. And uh, we can give to others, which um, creates self-empowerment. Um, we can help uh, by assisting our neighbors in whatever needs they have at a moment's notice which is real hard if you're just living in separate houses on a um, regular block. We can share our skills, our knowledges, the personal histories we have that will build a sense of home and family among the members of the community. And then for young families, um, we can help with child care and the become, in quotes, grandparents and have grandkids relationships there at the community uh, on a, a natural basis where we are there to support the parents and the kids and the kids are there to support us as well with their um, delightful growing up processes. Um, this builds character and knowledge and understanding uh, in all of us and uh, we know that um, it's going to be a very well-developed structurally and um, socially community as uh, it's, Peter Spalding has developed it over the years. Um, and uh, everyone has, that has been involved has, had a uh, has been a participant in sharing their opinions and skills in the development of the community. We, we appreciate so, your call, ma'am. We're, we're well over three minutes, but we, we appreciate you calling in and speaking on this matter. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, is that it or is there one more? Mayor, we have one last caller. All right. Caller 418, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Caller 418. Caller 418, there you are. This is Stan Cole. Uh, I didn't really know, I didn't, don't have an exact thing to, con to uh, comment on, on, on these particular uh, issues here. All right. Okay, thanks, Stan. Appreciate it. All right, let's go ahead and close uh, the, the, the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-49. Um, seeing of Council Member Christensen.
Um, yeah, I just have a few comments. Um, well, I have one question for Peter Spalding after that he can answer after this. Um, I've been hearing about the, uh, I was very, very enthused about this for quite some time. Uh, I've been hearing about this for 10 years, I believe. And I do wish them good luck. I do think it has the potential to be something really wonderful and creative and interesting. I would ask the people involved to be very cognizant of the fact that they are changing that neighborhood forever from one that was uh, semi-rural where people walked their dogs and um, looked out over a wide landscape. Now they will be looking at houses. And so um, I would just ask people to be cognizant of that and uh, really make friends with the neighborhood, not just your own community. Um, I would also like to, uh, I would also like um, Mr. Spalding to uh, explain why he, they were not able to actually put in the pedestrian path that would have been really uh, a, an asset to the neighborhood uh, in 10 years. Mr. Spalding? <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mayor Bagley and City Council members. Um, yeah, so for uh, your for the first part of your comments, uh, as far as making friends with the neighbors, currently um, I have hope for, so we started this project in 2015. The concept plan was approved in 2016. And uh, since then I have opened up the property uh, for, their, for the neighbors to walk their animals on our property. So I've already engaged with many of the neighbors and they all know who I am and they all know the level of transparency I've offered to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons why we're donating the park is so that they do have access. Prior to me coming, um, bringing this project to the city of Longmont, no one was able to really enjoy the land or walk the land at all. So they were only along to were only able to walk their dogs or to walk the neighborhood along Spruce Avenue. Um, I thought we were going to be doing a, a, a presentation, um, but the, one of the reasons or the reasons why we can't do the Northwest Trail on the west side, there are several issues. Um, one, you all know that those properties on the west boundary are Boulder County. So um, that poses. That's right. That's right. Yeah, both properties on both sides of Francis Street are Boulder County. They haven't been annexed into Longmont yet. So there's going to be an additional review criteria there for us for the new infrastructure. When we originally proposed the trail, it was a five foot wide crush gravel trail that we were going to do. And um, over time, in order to meet code, the city want, really wanted a 10 foot wide concrete road. And that just didn't fly at all with the neighbors. Mm -hmm. So in response to that, um, I asked uh, the Hildebrandts, Public Works, myself, and my design team all to come together. We met at the planning department and we all came up with a feasible plan. And uh, so in, in our presentation this evening, um, uh, uh, Susan, can you bring that up? Ava, is it time for, for us to go ahead and do that or? Uh, sure, yes. Um, council members and mayor, we, we did have a staff presentation and an applicant presentation. I'm willing to waive mine uh, if you don't need any background. Uh, and so Susan, if you'd like to queue up uh, Peter's PowerPoint. Um, so uh, go to the next page, please. So this is just a, a pers aerial perspective. Um, basically, it shows the layout of our design, the future city park, the area where we'll be doing the community supported agriculture. It's a 46 unit development, four affordable units, six live work units, 36 residential units and 8,000 square feet of amenities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Oh. 
Hang on just a minute. For some reason, it was stuck on pause. Let's do that again. Do you see it now? Yes. So I want to concentrate on the graphic um, in the bottom right corner. Uh, you can see where Bond Farm co-housing community property is in the gray, and then the colored area is the um, the future city park. And the lines going east and west from Bond Farm are the existing trails. So there's a 40 foot elevation change from the southwest portion of our property to the northwest portion of our property. And that grade um, exceeds 15%. So it's really not a safe grade. Um, so working with uh, natural resources, parks and natural resources, um, we all came up with a plan. If you look up at, at the graphic on the right where it has the blow up portion, there's a Bond Farm Neighborhood Association Park that's managed by, managed by the neighbors. Mm -hmm. That white line that's going through the park is the existing gravel. So the city, so what we worked out as an alternative to having the, the uh, Northwest trail along the west boundary of our property is to go ahead and turn that crushed gravel uh, pathway and do all the survey work on that site and then add the existing concrete uh, five foot wide trail that would connect Bond Farm co-housing community to the west side of the future city park and then we would continue the sidewalk from the east side of this future city park and carry it to Grant Street. And that meets all the ADA uh, requirements. Uh, so we feel that that's a, a much better design. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to the next slide, please. So having worked with the Hildebrandt's Public Works and our design team, this was an acceptable plan for um, the Hildebrands and uh, Mark von Wagner and the other two properties that uh, are in the cul-de-sac south of our property. Mm -hmm. Thank what you. We have been, I'm I sorry. Think, thank you. I think that's this is a good explanation of, of the difficulties. Yeah. So the so they wanted something that was much more green and not so intrusive on their property. So this was the design that we came up with. Right. Um, along the entire uh, process over the last couple of years, um, I've been working with Mark who has the property north of the Hildebrands. And um, we all agreed that this was probably the best design and least intrusive on their property because they're very concerned about their property values. Um, so, Having worked with Public Works, uh, the planning department um, has agreed to this design and it was passed by the Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously. So um, we've, we're confident that all the parties uh, feel that this is a good design and we feel that the route that would take pedestrians to the east to Grant Street and down Grant Street to First Avenue is, um, is the safest and, and best route for the local pedestrians. And then also we did a pedestrian study with the traffic study and I have Brian Horn on the line, who's our traffic engineer. And the, the pedestrian traffic is actually very light here along Spruce. So, and my office faces the road. So I've been, um, I, I know all the people that walk by here and, and the quantity of people that walk by. So we basically came down to a decision to make this proposal and um, it's been accepted by, like I said, planning and zoning. All, all right, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Sure. All right, does that answer your question? Councilor yes, Remember? thank you. All right. Um, the, uh, let's see here. All right, we've already had the public hearing on this matter. Um, so does someone wanna make a motion, somebody? I will move ordinance 2020-49. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Myself, the Councilman Martin seconded it. All in favor, say aye. 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 
Opposed, say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-49 passes unanimously. All right, let's move on to the items that we pulled from the consent agenda. A, I believe, and G were it. A, Councilmember Christensen, let's start with A, ordinance 2020-51, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations. Okay, I'm not sure that um, this includes what I wanted to discuss. I, I, I wanted to make a few comments about 529 jump funding, which I believe is part of this. Is that correct or not? No? No, I don't think so. Jim? Sorry. Uh, no, it's not. This is a uh, uh, additional appropriations ordinance for 2020. And it concerns the Windy Gap firming project. Oh, okay. So if we could, right. so Paul, if we could uh, have you make those comments either um, at, during mayor and council member comments at the end of the meeting, or if you want us to discuss something in the future, yeah, we can talk about it early next meeting uh, during yeah. the appropriate time, or just talk to me and text me and say, hey, I'd like to put this on the agenda. A hundred percent of the time, anyone has ever asked me to put something on the agenda, I have so. All right, um, but okay. you want to- we, you want Mayor, to yeah, Harold? We actually wanted to pull this as staff for like a two slide presentation on the numbers on this one. Nope, no, go ahead, throw it up. <laughs> Becky. All right, I don't know. I think Dale was gonna say something here, but. I am. So um, as uh, Becky gets ready to, to present this item, uh, Mayor Bagley and members of city council staff thought it was important to take just a couple of minutes. Uh, if you read the appropriation on its face, we don't believe it's really clear with regards to the actions that are happening on the Windy Gap firming project. Uh, this appropriation is one that uh, the council needs to consider ahead of us uh, bringing to you on November 10th, uh, the Windy Gap allotment contracts and the escrow agreement along with the transfer of capacity to both Loveland and Fort Lupton. And so uh, I think it's important to, both for the public and for council's understanding to take just a couple of minutes. And I think Becky can walk us through about two slides to, to make that clear. Great, yes, good evening, mayor and council members. I'm Becky Doyle, uh, assistant director of business services. Can we get the next slide, Susan? Awesome, so we just have two quick tables of numbers here. Um, when we last spoke about the Windy Gap Firming Project in August, uh, we were talking about this uh, line here or this column here in the middle uh, where the total contribution from the city to the project would be $55.8 million, uh, which included an accounting of our previous contributions to the project as well as an estimated future contribution of just under 48 million. The contract that you will see on November 10th, along with the second reading of this appropriation ordinance, shows that we uh, have a, a future contribution to the project of 49.98 million. And uh, additionally, we are now accounting for the, the reimbursement that we have received for our sunk costs uh, for the transferred capacity to uh, PRPA, which was completed when we moved from 10,000 acre feet to 8,000 acre feet as well as the transfers to Loveland and Fort Lupton that will be approved, uh, that will be on, on the agenda on November 10th. So uh, all of those things taken together, uh, the, the total cost has gone from 55.8 million to 56.3. So there is a small cost increase overall of $546,000, uh, which is um, you know, approximately 1% of the total project cost. So uh, next slide, please. So the, why are you seeing if the project cost has increased $500,000, why is the appropriation request for 4.8 million? Uh, along with um, getting to the actual number that we will need to provide to, uh, to the project uh, after execution of the allotment contract, um, we're also rebalancing which funds that money is coming from. So there are four funding sources that we're using to pay for the project. Uh, the first listed here is water cash acquisition, and that has a revenue source of cash in lieu of water rights um, received as, as property is platted in the city, and that can only be used for expanding water supply. So we need to uh, use as much as possible for that it's the, on this supply project. And since we last appropriated funds for the project, 
an additional approximately a million dollars has become available in that fund balance. So that's the first number over in the right that's part of the appropriation request. Um, no change to the raw water storage fund, which can only be used for storage projects such as, as this. And then the water construction fund is uh, a funding source that has uh, revenues that come from system development fees as new uh, properties become part of the water utility. We also had additional available fund balance there. And so we're increasing the contribution from that fund. So what that means is that the approved uh, water bonds that uh, the electors approved in 2017, um, we had allocated 35.58 from those bonds uh, to be part of the project costs. But as you can see, the required contribution from the bonds actually decreases uh, to get to our total 49.98 million. And what that means is that increasing those other funding sources um, decreases the, the amount of debt that's required to finance the project in full, uh, thereby decreasing burdens on ratepayers. So, and that's all I have there. <laughs> all right, great. Uh, Polly, would you like to make a motion on Ordinance 2020 Councilor Peck? Thank you. I just have a couple of questions, Becky. The very first slide you said there was, uh, uh, Fort Lupton was in that bulk. Can you explain one more time why what Fort Lupton is doing? Are we selling water to Fort Lupton? You're muted, Dale. <laughs> um, council Member Peck, um, what's happening is when the council decided to go from 8,000 to 7,500 acre feet in the project, uh, that 500 uh, acre foot adjustment, the city has been able to convey that, if you will, to both a portion of it to Fort Lupton and a portion of it to the city of, of Loveland. And so those two entities are paying us, and you'll see that on November 10th, uh, for their uh, pro rata share of our sunk cost. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Paula, you pulled it. Do you want to make the motion or do you want somebody else to do that? Somebody else. All right, I'll move ordinance 2020-51. Second. All right, it's been moved by myself, seconded by Councilmember Martin. All in favor of ordinance 2020-51, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Uh, that ordinance 2020-51 passes unanimously. Polly, you are at Mayor Christensen. Uh, let's move on to 10G, ordinance 2020-57, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 11 of the, uh, yeah, junk or abandoned vehicles. Okay. Once again, uh, I'm not voting for this. Um, once again, we refer to sleeper vehicles. If you Google sleeper vehicle, it states that a sleeper vehicle is one that is both economical and high powered. It has nothing, it's an erroneous term and it confuses things. We need to put at the beginning, well, that's one objection. We need to define what we're doing. What we're supposed to be doing here is trying to fix the problem of people living and residing and sleeping in their vehicles on the street. But we're not doing that. We're basically making everything, every RV illegal and then working it back to make it mostly it's illegal, but you have to come down and you have to get a permit and then just state what you're trying to do. It is illegal to, if this is what we want to do, it is illegal to live, reside and um, sleep in your vehicle on the streets of Longmont. If that's what we wanna do, then we should say that. Secondly, we need to define what kind of vehicles, which would be, it's later on down here at the bank, at the end, it says, it does list a number of vehicles and it should also say, or any vehicle converted to be used to sleep in. I, I just, I think that this whole thing is a mess. We have not fixed the problem of um, this being under junked and uh, well, it's called 
abandoned or publicly kept vehicles. Most people don't really understand what a publicly kept vehicle is. And we also still have the uh, ordinance in here about um, unregistered vehicles being uh, junked vehicles. We need, I thought we had agreed that we were gonna separate out vehicles with expired plates as not something subject to towing. I know some people think that they're not towed, they're towed. That, that they're not, it's not evenly enforced. It is unevenly enforced against people who are poor and that's wrong. So I, I'm not voting for this till it's straightened out. All right, that, that was the, I, you are right that we did decide and talk about unregistered vehicles being yes. labeled as junk vehicles, but that's a, that's a different ordinance. Well, it suppose. isn't, it's in here. Uh, it, 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 okay, I, I, I guess my, I've got a question for, for Mr. Hole. Um, my question is, uh, Council Member Christensen pointed out or has brought up some questions about the definitions and looking at Google. Does the statute clearly define those terms? My opinion, it does. Okay, all right. I'm going to go ahead and move uh, orders 2020-57. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Let's go ahead and have debate on the matter. Councilmember Peck. Um, I have some questions about this. I'm gonna go back to the uh, ordinance. Um, and if you go to uh, page one, section two, line 16, um, it says something about, hold on. Oh, where, where it says street, alley, or other right of way. Can you tell me if right of way includes pub, city of Longmont, public parks, and public trailheads? Because I remember specifically amending that motion to include that. So what does right of way mean? My interpretation is that the public property section, the very first term, covers all of the things that you just talked about. Okay. Any vehicle parked on public property, including, and so the including doesn't, it's not an exhaustive list. It's any, anything that falls under public property. And so the trailheads fall under public property in the same way. Okay. Um, okay, hold on. I also have page two, section one, uh, where you say any vehicle, um, it starts out any vehicle other than a sleeper vehicle left on public property, in a, including any portion of a highway street alley or right away for 48 hours or longer. Um, when you say any vehicle, are you talking about any car, whether any car in Longmont that is left on public property on a public street is uh, not allowed? for over 48 hours. And I apologize for the confusion here. That That's in the current code. It got reshuffled, so it looks like a new addition, uh, but that's that's just in the current code and been moved around. That's, well, that's, think, that's how it's- I am going to make a motion then that we uh, remove this. It, it is very, or we reword it. It's very confusing. For example, when you say any vehicle, if I leave, there are many, many sections of this town that do not have garages and they park on public, right in front of their house on the road. I find that this, this little paragraph here is not equitable to our city. It, it targets the lower east side and the lower west side of the older homes that do not have any garages or any place to park. If they, if they are gone for uh, a weekend, if they are home for the weekend or three days for a three day holiday, and they don't move that car, then this subjects them to being towed or ticketed. And I don't think we should leave this up to the discretion of our public safety department to decide whether to tow that that vehicle or not it does there's no way to to say that that owner 
of that house also owns the car parked in front of their street. So um, I think this is a problem. We need to, uh, we just need to remove it. It doesn't make any sense. Any, vic any vehicle, except for a sleeper vehicle. All right, well, there, there's currently a motion on the table. I guess my, my, uh, my comments are, Councilmember Peck, it would be just as easily, what if I take my car and I park in front of their house for longer than 48 hours and they can't get any parking? Because I, I parked my car there. If we, you, were, you were a member of council. If I remember correctly, you voted for this. No, that, that's not a, that's not, I'm not questioning you. I mean, what I'm saying is we, we debated this and we didn't want cars parked on the street. I, I, remember I wanted 72 hours. And then I believe it was Jeff Moore that made the motion to go to 48. And uh, we, we made it 48 out, 48. I would not be opposed to revisiting the matter, but not, not necessarily tonight in this particular motion. I wouldn't have a problem bringing it up in the future. Me, me personally. Well, well, this is what this is what first ordinance is about, Mayor Bagley. Mm -hmm. And yes, I did vote for this, but as we have moved forward, it's time to look at what is not working in our ordinances, and this is the time to do it uh, on first ordinance. Um, do we do we uh, all vote to let this ordinance go through, and then we bring it back again in seven or eight months? It, that to me doesn't make any sense. Um, why, why would we do that? This is the time to look at this draft and decide whether we want to vote for it as is, or do we so need- the, Right, I guess, I guess my, uh, this is the, other than, um, have, has anybody gotten any complaint from anybody about a 48 hour time limit or parking on our streets? I mean, Councilman Christian, you're nodding your head, but who, when, where? I, I've, I haven't heard of one. I constantly get complaints. All right, so. That was, just, that was the other one. Um, all right, so well, there's a motion on the floor. Okay. Um, and uh, Councilman Christensen. Um, I also think that we agreed that we would not, that this would be taking place January 1st or something, that we would not bring this forth until we had actually tried to find, locate places where um, people who are now living in RVs could relocate. Right. That means talking to both Boulder County and Weld County. Um, all of the RV parks are booked up solid for any foreseeable future and new ones are not being built. And right. we have no, uh, I don't know that we have talked to Weld County. I don't know that we have talked uh, at length with um, Boulder County. So I think we should table this until we have actually done something about that. Let's hear from Mr. Hole. The last section of the ordinance sets the effective date at January 1st. So it's not a code change, but it's the last section of the ordinance. And so the, uh, would anyway, thank you. All right, is there anybody else who wants to speak for or against this? Councilman Martin? Yeah, I just have a bunch of questions to clarify about this. So we um, have the effective date of the ordinance uh, to be January 1st, which means that we have not been able to arrange any place off the streets for sleeper vehicles to park. So the solution is just to let them uh, exist under the present ordinance for another two months. Is that what you're saying? Let, let me jump in and, and Go ahead, Harold. answer a couple of these questions that came out. So, and I may ask Karen to jump in with me on this conversation. So the first piece is we have had conversations with Boulder County. Um, this did go to, um, Karen, if you can help me, the HSBC. Um, HSBC, I'll let Karen Executive get into board. that. The Executive Board of the HSBC. Um, they um, did not support the request of using the fairgrounds, but they brought other options in play that they wanted to, to put forward. So that was one piece. 
the item still has to go to the Boulder County Commissioners within the next few weeks. That obviously got caught up with the work that they, Boulder County was doing with the fire. Um, Jan and I did touch base late last night, and so it'll be in the next few weeks when that goes to the commissioners for them to consider and talk about. That's one piece. The piece on the other side that I think Council Member Christensen was talking about was the individual who wanted to expand his um, existing location that was in Weld County. We, we have connected with that individual um, and we are setting up a meeting with him so that we can help facilitate a conversation with Weld County on that issue. So we have had both of those conversations. Okay. Karen, do you want to add what HSBC has put forward? Uh, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Harold, Mayor and City Council. So the, um, so the, as Harold mentioned that the the executive board of the Homeless Solutions for Boulder County did not support using the fairgrounds in, in the way that um, that was requested. But, um, but, but a couple of things, I, the um, Boulder County did submit um, for Longmont um, a, a couple of things. One was a proposal as part of the emergency solutions grant that was submitted in on, on October 23rd for uh, $180,000 for um, for bridge housing um, and basically for paying for hotel space for um, for folks who needed temporary housing that certainly would apply to people who would be impacted by this particular ordinance who are currently using their sleeper vehicles on public property for um, for living. Um, the second thing is and and we the county should hear by mid-November whether or not they were successful in receiving that grant. So we don't know. Um, if they are successful in receiving that grant, what the, um, what the executive board is gonna recommend to the commissioners is that the county figure out a way or explore a way to upfront those dollars uh, so that um, we would have access to those funds sooner as opposed to later to help people who'd be impacted by this particular ordinance. Sometimes it takes a few months to, um, to execute a contract with the state. And so that was their recommendation was to um, upfront those funds if indeed the state did grant the funds to Boulder County. Um, and the second piece of that grant was, um, was also to fund uh, an outreach team that would um, that would certainly continue to work in in Longmont, um, similar to what they've implemented in the city of Boulder, um, an outreach team that would really work more specifically with people experiencing homelessness to help get folks into um, housing and exited from homeless on a um, on a more uh, to be continue to look at outreach efforts to get people into housing that have been um, difficult to get into housing. So that's the recommendation from the executive board that again would go to the county commissioners, which Harold had mentioned would, will probably be happening um, after the first part of November. So I had several other questions um, related to this. Uh, one of them is um, uh, residents have called in, uh, one resident in particular has called in and asked a question that I suspect other uh, RV or sleeper vehicle dwellers have, which is what happens to the vehicle. In particular, one person has more than once expressed the sentiments that his vehicle would be confiscated and that he would be jailed. Can mm -hmm. I have somebody, because I'm pretty sure nobody's gonna be jailed um, for being homeless. We don't do that, but um, I'd like to hear somebody say it. What's going to happen to the vehicles and what's going to happen to the person? Hi, uh, this is Jeff Satter, Mayor Council. Um, I did ask Don to load a form, but uh, on police and code enforcement, um, we do tag these vehicles. I got an example of uh, it's in Spanish and English. Uh, we would continue that practice. Uh, as an example, um, 
Most of our abandoned vehicles and junk vehicles are complaint based as Mayor Bagley stated. Uh, it's parked in front of somebody's home. Uh, there are hundreds of miles of roadway in our city and our officers uh, don't have an idea of whether a car belongs at a house or not. It's usually based on a complaint from someone in that neighborhood about a vehicle. Uh, so we tagged the vehicle uh, in 2019 uh, with cars. Uh, we tagged uh, 2000, or I'm sorry, we responded on 2,417 abandoned vehicle complaints. And in 2019, or I'm sorry, in 2020, we've responded to 1,796 abandoned vehicle complaints. In 2020, we have towed 30 cars. And in 2020, in 2019, we towed 61. So most of the people have complied with the request to move their vehicle uh, after it was tagged or notified. And again, it's not officers finding these vehicles. It's based on a complaint from a neighbor or somebody pointing out and saying, there's a car that's been parked in front of my house for multiple days. Could you please come in and check on it? Um, we do the same thing with RVs and um, we use that same form and we would continue to use that form. So if we did notify the owner of an RV that their uh, RV or sleeper vehicle was illegally parked, they would have an opportunity to move that vehicle to another location. Um, and what the city ordinance says that they should not move it to another public street in our city, but they should find somewhere else There's uh, there's our uh, tag right there if you want to look at it. But we do give lots of warning and uh, because of the busyness, we often do not come back for a day or two or three sometimes before we can get back to those vehicles. But currently we, we repeatedly tag and uh, chase these vehicles around. As you know, uh, we get a lot of complaints about these RVs being parked at different locations and uh, trashing the neighborhoods and concerns about all kinds of, of issues associated with those vehicles. So we would be tagging them, but we, uh, we don't arrest people for, for this ordinance. We would impound the vehicle. So so I'm gonna couple of specific answers to the question. So Tim, can someone go to jail for this? In the way the code's no. written. Jeff. Not so. that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm I've I'm not aware of anybody that's ever gone to jail for an abandoned vehicle. So that that's the, the first question that I think Councilmember Martin asked. I think the second question's a little bit harder to answer because it also depends on the condition of the RV and whether it's movable or in its condition at the end of the day. Because if you remember, some of the issues we have um, with some of the RVs is they're not in operating condition. They have issues in terms of their gray water systems, which is contaminating the streets. And, and so the condition of that vehicle is going to be a significant part of the conversation um, in, in terms of, of how we deal with it. And if, if go, the go vehicle, ahead, come, Marcia. Yeah, I'm sorry, I had a list. Um, if the vehicle is contaminating the streets, or if the d d vehicle dweller is caught in the act of either dumping trash or sewage uh, in the streets, how is that different than tagging a vehicle? So I'm going to look to Nathan on, on that issue um, because that does get into our stormwater permitting, permitting as well. But Nathan, if you were to see somebody dumping gray water, what would you do? Absolutely. Um, Councilman Martin and, and Mayor and Council. One of the, I think the 
the trick here is that, yes, we do have specific codes that would govern both illegal dumping and littering and that kind of an offense that we might be able to observe either in person or by witness accounts or by surveillance camera footage or something like that. And that's its own code. Same with any kind of potential discharge in the storm drain system. Those are those we, those already that already exists in the code. Um, that would carry any potential number of fines or a summons into court, depending on the most appropriate, um, depending on the situation, would dictate how that enforcement route would go. But the, what we've learned from experience is that uh, almost never do we have significant evidence to follow through with any of those violations. To, to say, okay, we've got probable cause of proof beyond reasonable doubt to issue a specific person, because oftentimes there are more than one person living in an RV, to issue a specific person a summons into court or a fine. And so enforcement of those particular codes becomes extremely difficult, and it's pretty rare to have that be the case. Yeah, I get a lot of complaints about that, because no matter how many videos or photos or um, you know, time-lapse photography, no matter what people have got, it never seems to be sufficient evidence. So maybe you could edify the public right now by explaining what would be sufficient evidence, because I really don't like it that people are getting away with this. I agree. Uh, and I think that, again, depending on the situation, any, any number of combination of sources of evidence, whether it's a combination of witness testimony and really good surveillance camera footage that might capture a person's face or lead them to specific identity. We have to identify that person um, and a combination of officer observation. All of that goes into um, what we would use to issue a sorry. summons. So I think, sorry, I couldn't mute it when I was sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> um, clear, clear video of the person so they can identify the person's face without any, I mean, it's got to be really clear. They've got to be able to identify it, license plate numbers. I know when we were, we were struggling with a couple of alleys, we've even tried to place those and it was difficult even in what we used to get enough to, to find the illegal dumping that was occurring. And of course, the, the burden of proof is on us to, to, to come to that evidence, you know, we have to present all that um, beyond a reasonable doubt, and that poses a very high standard. But if you said officer observation, does that mean an officer has to, has to observe it no matter how good the other evidence is? Not necessarily. Of course, if, if there's other evidence that is significant or that causes, that rises to the level of proof beyond reasonable doubt, then absolutely we'll use that evidence. But oftentimes it's difficult. Oftentimes we're, we're not presented with that. Um, and some of the best cases would come, some of the most definitive cases would come from officer observation where I physically have to see that person, identify that person and say, yeah, I watched them commit X, Y, and Z offense. Um, and that's very rare. So time, time out. So Mr. Holt, Mr. Holt, can you just please address the punishments that are in the statute? I mean, we're talking theory and enforcement. In the statute, what does the statute say is the punishment for this particular ordinance that we're about to vote on? So the punishment section hasn't um, really been amended from the previous section. It's just the, the length of time someone can be parked in the public street. And so it's a civil punishment. It is not, uh, Boom. not a so there, punishment. So, right. So, the, so, I mean, this conversation is completely irrelevant. I'm losing my, I'm losing my patience. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, uh, Dr. Waters, let's go with you. Marsha, were you finished? No, and it's not irrelevant. We stopped talking about whether people were going to be jailed a long time ago. We we're talking about whether people were going to be apprehended for this crime or fined or whatever. And that, that's uh, not a, my, my point is it's not a criminal statute. No, it's, it's not, not a criminal, a criminal statute. statute no one settled that a long time ago. Right. But so what I'm saying I, is that, so, I mean, the, the conversations, I mean, it's basically if the vehicle is there, it's a vehicle, it's a vehicle civil issue. And apparently Meaning, in the case of dumping, it's a personal civil issue and the license plates aren't good enough. And that's important. All right. Let's so keep keep going, Marsha, but you're 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 well over 20 minutes, but keep going. I'm done. All right, Dr. Water. All right, real quick, uh, can we we it seems to me like we need to bifurcate a couple of issues. One is what are we doing with abandoned vehicles, whether they're RVs or not? 
And then, and then how does the ordinance treat RVs that are not abandoned in which people are living? So if I could sort that, uh, Jeff, I heard you say that over the last, uh, what, 12, 10, 22 months, uh, there have been 91 vehicles uh, that were abandoned, Correct. that had been towed. Correct. Now, I, he I heard in an earlier council meeting, a council member make reference that the city should have no business towing vehicles. If those, if the city was not towing vehicles, what would the status of those 91 vehicles be tonight? Well, uh, they would still be on the street, as I suspect, and uh, that's not including the other 4,000 that either got tagged or the officer responded on. So those also might still be in that same location if somebody had not notified the vehicle owner that it needed to be moved. So um, I've heard that, that a, a vehicle that is not licensed is not necessarily abandoned. And I, and I understand that, and I would agree with that. Um, but it's, is it safe to assume that most of a, abandoned vehicles are not, are not registered or not licensed? I mean, just because it's not licensed doesn't mean it's not abandoned. You could have an unlicensed abandoned vehicle, and then if the city doesn't tow it, it's going to sit in some in front of somebody's house for how long? Yeah, until somebody tags it and moves it on. A lot of times, the vehicle has, you know, broken down and they're not doing anything with it. Uh, occasionally, it's a steel that hasn't been found yet. So. Shannon, I think, had some answers to that. Well, and, and I, all my point is, I, it, uh, I don't think we did agree. We talked. We talked about abandoned vehicles, but I don't. I didn't. I don't recall agreeing to taking that out of this ordinance. All right, that section. Um, so, from my from my understanding is that if a if a vehicle is abandoned, if it, if a vehicle hasn't moved, and a, and there's a complaint. And it's sitting in front of somebody's house, licensed or not. If you can identify that vehicle attached to that home, you might, you're going to advise somebody or, you know, that, that you had a complaint, but that vehicle goes with that home. Is that correct? That vehicle is not going to get towed. That's correct. And we would also probably notify the person that called in this complaint and say, that's your neighbor's vehicle. And, and so, so now let me take that same concept and apply it to RVs. An RV that's parked in some in front of somebody's home that belongs to that homeowner and they're loading or unloading, they have 72 hours to do the unloading and, and loading and unloading, no harm, no foul, correct? 48. Uh, right now, they're supposed to be actively unloading and, and loading. But, but, they, but they get those 72 hours. They have a homeowner can for for now if we pass this ordinance for twenty five dollars, uh, get a permit to have the RV of a family member or a friend in front of their home for a week, and they can renew that for four weeks. So if they could for a month during a calendar year have the RV of a homeowner or a homeowner of a family member or a friend in front of their home for up to up to a month with a twenty five dollar a week permit. Is that correct? Correct. I see a council member shaking their, her head no. That's what this law says, correct? In one hole. That is. Let's go so let, me, let, me, now, let, not, let me go one more step. You have a homeowner who owns an RV parked in front of their home, not loading or unloading. And you get a, you, Jeff, you get a complaint from a neighbor who doesn't like the fact that the RV is parked in front of that homeowner's home. Um, you get the complaint, you show up, or code enforcement shows up. Um, do you give that homeowner a pass, or do you enforce the ordinance with that homeowner? We would contact the homeowner and say we've had a complaint about your RV and ask them to move it as soon as possible. How, how is that different than an RV that's there that's not owned by that homeowner? How, how do you differentiate, or do you, the enforcement, because that's one of the complaints we've heard, and, and, and disappointment in council members that we haven't raised this question. How, how, do you how do you enforce that ordinance differently for the owner of the RV who's parked 
for longer than 48 hours, it was given the current ordinance in front of the home of someone in town or you know wherever it's parked. Well, under the ordinance, both persons have an obligation to move their RV. Do you, so, do you enforce yeah. it the same way with the homeowner as you would the, mm -hmm. the, the RV owner who's not the homeowner in front, who doesn't own the home in front of the which the bar, RV is parked? Yes, we would have that conversation and say, here's the ordinance. Uh, you're not unloading or loading. You would need to move your RV as soon as possible or you'll be in violation of the ordinance unless so the you have the permit. So you don't differentiate, you enforce it the same whether right. it's owned by a homeowner and there's a complaint or it's, it's not owned by the homeowner and it's simply parked in front of that homeowner's home. Correct. All right, I, I'm gonna move from RVs to uh, the, the kind of the related concern here about homelessness. Karen, are you still available? Karen Roney? Yes, I'm available. Yes, I am. Thank you. So earlier today, I got, a, I got an email from a resident um, and I may, we may have all received it, um, uh, asking the question, how is what we're proposing to do anything other than harassing our homeless population? What's your response to that? It's view, this is viewed by someone as harassing our homeless population. Well, uh, Mayor and, and Council, what I would say is that this ordinance is really about getting um, junked and abandoned vehicles, RV vehicles uh, off the street um, and not so they can't park in public, pro public property. So it's really about where vehicles can be parked. They cannot be parked in public property. That's what this is about. And so that's what this is about. I'll stop there. <laughs> so somebody's, <laughs> so somebody's in an RV. I know I'm on the clock, but you guys heard 20 minutes. So I'm going my time's up. Somebody is living in an RV who, who would like to be in permanent housing. Right. What will you do to help get, get them into permanent housing? So, so what we have indicated is that we would, in, we would do outreach this next couple of months before this uh, takes place, if you passed it. And we would work with that, um, that individual or who individuals in that situation. And we would work to uh, link them up and get them into, into housing. And so that is what we would be doing. So what if it's stable housing rather than sleeping in a, a, a vehicle. And if somebody is in their RV and doesn't want you to help them get into stable housing. We can't force then, anything. Yeah, um, but, th but that person would be notified or advised that they have a limited time to have that RV parked and after January 1st, they couldn't be, be parked right. on a public street. And, and certainly our interest would be working with uh, individuals to uh, hopefully build a relationship and work toward a housing option. So talk just a little bit then about your outreach effort, because uh, there was an assertion in an email exchange that, well, the city doesn't do any outreach. It's just, this is just a way to, you know, to keep moving homeless along. Um, you talked about a homeless outreach team. How much do we know about the population living in RVs today right. by circumstance and by choice? So what I would say, how I would answer that is today, we do have outreach efforts. We have Hope has uh, um, Andy Schwartz who does regular outreach. We have um, our uh, individual that works for the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless that does uh, coordinated entry diversion and also does outreach and we also have our uh, some of our officers that do um, that do outreach and so that's our team now and so we would rally that team and that we would continue to do um, outreach that that's happening today you have a pretty and, good idea of, of of who is in an rv by by circumstance who would like to be in housing and and who's in an rv by by choice that doesn't want to be in, in, in other kinds of housing. Right. Is that fair? Right, and we will continue to do that. Um, we can continue to do that at outreach that we have. And as I mentioned earlier, we do have a proposal um, for additional monies. Again, that's in the future, maybe, that we could then continue to um, 
actually enhance our outreach efforts. So our, our goal would be certainly to help people who are living in their RVs and they're there by circumstance, they are looking for housing, we would be, we would be working with them to get them into um, housing with our system. Thanks. All right, I'll just listen now. All right, Councilmember Peck. Thank you. So my question right now is to Jeff Satter. Um, Jeff, you came to us two years ago, actually, needing help with the fact that you don't have the resources to work with this homeless population, I'm sorry, with the people living in their, not abandoned, not junk, people living in their RVs. Um, we don't have the resources for that. And you came to us for help. Um, does this ordinance as it stands address that? I believe it does. And I think Shannon Stadler and Nathan would also agree. But yes, it does help because it, it's, I think, stops the duplication of chasing these, these vehicles all over town okay. multiple, multiple times. So now my next question is to Karen and Harold. Um, so people who want to get out of their RVs because they do not want to live in them are going to go into coordinated entry, which is perfect. That's what we asked for. Um, but there's a queue for that. There's a queue for housing. There is a lot of demand for those vouchers. My question is, because I feel you, you are saying, correct me if I'm wrong, not, not you, Karen or Harold, but there are now 91, did you say, vehicles? Um, people living in vehicles on our streets now. Did I hear that correctly? From somebody? I think that was Jeff talking about numbers that we have seen. Okay. I don't know if that's today. Can I clarify? I'm the one that threw the number out. I heard Jeff talk about 60 vehicles had been towed in 2019. Correct. And 31 had been towed this year, about some which someone had complained. And after having gone through all of the stuff they go through in terms of noticing, it ultimately had towed those 91 vehicles. My question really was about if we hadn't towed them, what would have happened to them? That was the question. Okay. So, so thank you, Councilman Waters, for clarifying that. So, so what I because I heard 91. At the beginning of this conversation in September, we said the number was 60. So I thought, oh my gosh, we're exploding with people living in RVs. So um, Karen, again, my question to you is, if people who want to transition to housing, living in RVs, it takes seven or eight months, maybe longer because of the queue, because this is kind of what happened with homelessness is that we, we ended up with a coordinated entry, not on purpose, but because of our expanding homelessness, having a gap of people. And, and this is what I do, do not want the city to have, is a gap of people living on our streets, in their RVs, without access to any utilities, dumping stations or anything that was my proposal for the safe lot as a transition area so that we knew that if you didn't want to be in this safe lot, you were not committed to being in a home and having a caseworker, having us help you find a job. Everybody else who didn't want to take that on could not be in our city living on the streets. And that is what I wanted through this to address as we are ending up with evacuees, perhaps with climate migrants. We don't know. It is a way to look ahead before we are just. And that was the initial conversation. So I, I heard Harold say that he is working with the county and having more discussions on safe lots. But all I, but I don't hear you saying that, Karen. So is our city all on the same board, all on board with the same plan or not? Because this is, um, to me, this is the whole, it's a whole package deal for me. It isn't just hyperbole that 
And, and I, I think it makes it really hard for our public safety department. Anybody can in, oh. they want to live in a house, but not really want to not get on board with the program. So, so if I can jump in real quick. So yeah. when I say I've talked to Jana, I want to reiterate that Karen is talking to her counterpart and Ellie Berta is engaged in this. So we're all in that conversation okay, good. and we're in the other conversation in Weld County. Um, I think the thing that I want to bring ever, you know, when we talked about this, I think the motion was needed to be into conversation, needed to be in coordinated entry, Correct. needed to continue to be part of coordinated entry in terms yeah. of what we were doing. And those were two big pieces. Um, I remember when we brought Joseph in on the first part of the conversation and when he talked about the people living in RVs and how a, the majority of them didn't want to be um, in a coordinated entry program that was changing a little bit based on what we were seeing. So I think the challenge that we're facing as, as a community is mm -hmm. a couple of things. Um, one, the issue in the RVs that I'm hearing from Jeff and um, code enforcement is um, a part of the conversation of the moving around and the chasing, and then we get the calls from the neighborhoods and we continue to do right. that through the community. So that was the genesis of this. Right. As we look at this, um, and Karen jump in with me, I think what we've heard from the council and I think what we're committed to is, is really the coordinated entry program and ensuring that if people want to exit homelessness, that we mm -hmm. try to get them into the coordinated entry program, which ties to the additional revenue that Karen's working on in terms of bridge housing in, in those pieces. And so that's a component of it. Um, I think the motion was also that if we could use the um, the fairgrounds and that obviously got complicated because the one thing we said if there's a fire becomes a problem well sure enough it would have been a disaster had we had folks there during all of this um, was that they had to be in that coordinated entry program and so again it ties back into that so I think that's how we were trying to approach it um, I think the challenge is, and, and this is the conversation now with the other individual in terms of expanding their park, they're still gonna have to pay for a spot. And I think that's partially at, at the crux of this too, is that right now there's no payment in that. And I think, you know, the question we all have to think about is if we do something to create spots and our conversation with the individual was if we can work with him, I think he even said he would look at dedicating spots for Longmont. Will people pay to use those spots? And, that, and that's a different question. Karen, did I miss anything? All right. I think, I think everybody's spoken at least two times, except for Susie and Aaron. Do you two have anything to say on this matter? All right, Aaron, okay, all right. So we've got a motion on the floor, so let's go ahead and vote. Um, the motion is passing, basically the motion is to restate, it's item 9G, approving on first reading ordinance 2020-57, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 11 of the Longmont Municipal Code on vehicles abandoned, kept on public property or jumped, or jumped. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for November 10th, 2020. So we will have the chance to talk about this again. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. 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 All right. The motion carries four to three with myself, Councilmember Waters, Councilmember Hidalgo Faring, and Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, four. All right. Thank you. That was a good discussion. All right. Let's move on to um, general business. I'm going to move that we recess as the Longmont City Council and convene as the Board of Directors, the Longmont General Improvement District number one. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded by Councilmember Martin. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Aye. 
All right, the motion carries. We are now acting as the Longmont City, uh, not, no longer as the Longmont City Council, but as the Board of Directors, the Longmont General Improvement District number one. Resolution LGID 2020-05, a resolution fixing and levying taxes on the real and personal property within the Longmont General Improvement District number one for the year 2020 to pay budget expenses of the district for the 2021 fiscal year. This is the same question Council Member Peck had before. It is not increasing taxes. It is just fixing and levying them. Um, do we have a motion? I will move resolution LGID 2020-05. Second. All right, it's uh, moved by me, uh, second by Councilmember Christensen. Um, seeing no further dialogue, debate, or questions, all in favor uh, of resolution LGID 2020-05, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the, motion, the resolution carries unanimously. I'm going to move that we adjourn as the Longmont General Improvement District Number One Board of Directors and reconvene as the Longmont City Council. Second. All right, that was uh, I think that was Councilmember Peck, but I made the motion. Councilmember Peck seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the, that uh, motion carries unanimously. And then finally, Ordinance 2020-50, uh, which is 12D, by the way. A bill for an ordinance amending Title 10, Chapter 10.24, creating new Section 097 of the Longmont Municipal Code, creating a temporary prohibition on rental late fees due to COVID-19 related hardship. It was tabled after the introduction on October 13th, 2020, and it is now back. And I believe that the issue was we wanted to hear about some un possible unintended consequences if there were any. Who has a presentation? Karen, you popped up on my screen. I imagine that's you, Ms. Rona. That is me. So thank right. you, Mayor and City Council. So the um, so so basically, yes, this was uh, this item was tabled, and there were a couple of uh, things that the um, that council wanted to see. Number one, to get uh, input from the from both property owners and tenants about the possible impacts of this particular proposed ordinance we did and we had a we issued a we basically had a survey the survey results are in your um, we included those in your packet in a powerpoint presentation and um, don't plan to go over those unless you would like uh, staff to go over those but um, but that information is in your packet the other two things that have happened since this particular ordinance was uh, proposed ordinance was tabled was one, we did receive the results of the governor's task force. Um, the, basically the special eviction prevention task force. So that report was uh, issued and made available to the public in mid October and uh, shortly thereafter, the governor did issue an executive order which basically um, prohibited uh, late fees from uh, property owners for uh, uh, assessing late fees for late rental payments. So that is now an executive order. So what council was trying to do with this particular local ordinance was uh, is now an executive order issued by the governor that, that uh, prohibits late fees from being assessed um, through the end of December of 2020. So, so anyhow, so basically, I think council has uh, several options, but it, it sounds like that the governor's order, based on the recommendation from the task force, does accomplish what uh, we understood that city council wanted to do with this local ordinance. So it seemed like council could either decide to um, not move forward with this ordinance since the executive order accomplishes that or you can provide other direction to staff as you wish. Councilmember Christensen. Since I brought this forth, um, I suggest that we table this until um, the governor's uh, ban on late fees um, expires and then reconsider whether, d depending upon whether the what the circumstances are. Second. I say it at two, but I said, you can have that one, Marcia. All right, so the motion was to table this issue until after the governor's executive order uh, expires, um, including any renewal on his part, Councilmember Christensen. Um, yeah, if 
he renews it, then uh, we can continue to table it because okay. uh, yeah, I'm comfortable with that. I, I also would like to point out something though. Um, the initially the only people who were being interviewed were the landlords. It was only because I requested that tenants be interviewed. So they were interviewed a week later and only 50 out of probably 20,000 people in this town who are renters um, replied. So I don't really think that's a particularly um, significant um, survey. But anyway, but I do appreciate both of those. Um, I think they were good questions that were asked. Thanks. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Christensen, second by Councilmember Martin. All in favor of tabling ordinance 2020-50 until the governor's uh, executive order expires, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, tabling ordinance 2020-50, the motion passes unanimously. All right, let's go ahead and take a th two to three minute break as we get ready for final call public invited to be heard and we'll be back. All right, is everybody back? Just like that, we are. All right, thanks everybody. All right, let's open it up.
final call public invited to be heard. Is there anybody in the queue? Mayor, we did not get anyone calling in at this time. All right, we will close final call public invited to be heard and move on to mayor and council comments. Anybody? All right, Councilmember Bivago Faring. So um, yeah, there were a couple of things I wanted to talk about. And the first one, I actually, I feel really bad about this one. And I I want to make a personal apology to our staff and residents who um, listened in last week to the um, presentation. Um, and it was primarily directed towards our um, staff and residents who are of the Jewish community for a comment made by one of the presenters on the energy management metering architecture. Um, he had made a pretty offensive comment. It was a small comment. And I was hoping I was the only one who heard it. <laughs> but um, after talking with Harold earlier, um, so there were other staff who were um, offended by that. And, you know, it was pretty jolting to me and it was offensive. And so, what you know, the, the, I, I regret what, that I didn't interject earlier. Yes. What, what was the, com what was the comment or I don't recall. In reference to, um, and I, I, what was it? Harold, do you want to chime in? Cause I don't feel. Yeah. Saying it. <laughs> um, yeah. And I don't feel comfortable. It was, um, what was his name, Dale? It was um, Dr. Shock Shockley from Boulder. Yeah, and I so, wasn't going to say his name because I did not have a chance to talk with him personally, but but that's that's fine. But it was yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on who it was. Mm -hmm. And so he was talking. It was about the uh, information from Germany. And um, one of the Germans that he worked with um, said, um, you get so much information, um, you could find, um, how do I say this? Um, someone of the Jewish faith in a home. Um, and, and, and hearing from our staff in terms of Jewish descent was really a reference to, um, they felt the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, he didn't I, use, I missed that one. <laughs> he, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't use um, Jewish descent. Yeah. Um, he and and so that was uh, that was what. Um, it was pretty insensitive and hard, yeah. mm -hmm. and it was a very short comment. Um, I caught it. I was jolted by it. Part of me was maybe I was the only one who heard it, and you know, and I regret that. I regret that I didn't interject immediately to call things out, um, to call the, out these offensive comments as I hear them. So, you know, I was just wondering, and, you know, we don't have to answer this now. This is, you know, this is mayor and council comments. It's not a discussion. But in the future, when we do hear these, any kinds of insensitive or hurtful statements, um, what would be our procedure? Can we just interject? You immediate, you, you immediate, you, you immediately make a point of order. Okay. You stop the presentation, and uh, you know I, I don't I don't recall exactly hearing it. You know because uh, if that is true, I was true, hoping nobody else heard it. <laughs> but it's wow, not, I heard you it. No, I didn't. I didn't. But then again, as as but I was kind of I mean all that AMI stuff. I was just kind of like you know zoning out to tell you the truth. But yeah, immediately, if, if any one of us hears something that is insensitive or yeah. offensive, it's just a point of mayor, point of order, I will immediately stop the meeting and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll clarify what they said, you know, because, uh, yeah, I'm embarrassed if I didn't catch it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I apologize as well. You know, mm -hmm. if, if that was said that that specifically, that's terrible. So mm -hmm. um, and, you, you, it's not your well, place apologize for council it's it's all of us to apologize for council well, especially as mayor so. <laughs> no no i know but i mean it's 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 a, we, we i mean that it's and, and it's not our place to necessarily apologize for the comment it's just we should have said something That's what if, I have, if you yeah. hear it if you hear it speak up and mm -hmm. uh we'll we'll address it in a moment if we if we can and if you don't catch it in a moment do what you're doing now bring it up the following week and go did i hear that right is that what what yeah, uh, that's not that's not cool. So yeah. and I Good think 
And I think for council, I think it wasn't just you all that had that, did we just hear it? Because that's what we were saying is like, what did we think? And it was our, the conversation was already down the road. And so. Um, it was odd, but um, and, and it was hurtful and it was very insensitive. And I don't think that's a reflection of who we are as a community either. So that's why I felt the need to say something um, at, at least at this point. Um, and I hope it's not too late. Um, so for well, those- it'll be, it'll be interesting if Dr. Shockley reaches out with an apology. Yeah. You know, um, and then clarification. You know, I feel like this is a prime example of in um, intent versus impact. You know, our words have consequences, and sometimes we might not. We might say something, and that's not our intention, but the reality is the impact that it causes and the hurt that it causes um, right. to individuals in our community. Um, and then, so the other piece I wanted to bring up, and you know, I wanted to really send out a thanks to Carmen, uh, Harold, um, Rob Spenlow, our chief, Chief Spenlow, who was who were in on this meeting that we had with our Latinx um, advocacy group and members of um, El Comité board. Um, just to, in talking with, um, you know, we talked about a myriad of issues around um, race relations, community relations with. Um, uh, our public safety and kind of building those, um, breaking down those barriers and building bridges among the two, um, implicit bias and just even the upcoming election. There are there, you know, there are a lot of anxieties surrounding this issue. Um, I think we came across, we were able to discuss some some deep issues and just came up. I I mean, I thought it was very productive. I don't know how everyone else felt, <laughs> but um, in just having a path, moving a path forward not just dealing short term, but also long term in um, building bridges in, within our community and strengthening um, strengthening ties. So I really, I just wanted to, to thank to thank our city staff who were who were involved with this um, and their commitment to this work and continue to to build on it. So thanks. All right, Councilmember, we're going to go with Councilmember Christensen and Councilmember Martin. Thanks, Susie, first of all, for um, bringing that up. Um, you know, in the last, well, in the last decade, but especially the last three years, um, anti-Semitism and all sorts of hate groups and militias have gotten uh, a lot of publicity and um, a lot of people have been killed and, uh, you know, synagogues attacked and it's, uh, unbelievable to see this rising up again and it's all kinds of groups so uh, it's important to point it out um so i wanted to bring some little good news uh, uh, um alfalfa's is opening up brought 70 jobs to this town and uh, they open up on friday i think so um go visit and uh, be happy we've got a few more jobs here thanks all right, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. And with all due respect, I feel um, that it is unseemly um, to have our mayor make statements about being bored with all this AMI stuff. It is a point of serious contention among the people of the city it is something that is extremely important to another constituency that we heard from tonight about achieving 100% renewable energy. And it's something that our LPC staff is working extremely hard on. And I think that we should consider it with the uh, seriousness that it deserves. All right, anybody else? All right, I guess I will respond. As we discussed at lunch, Council Member Martin or Marsha, um, I'm not saying that I was bored with the topic. I'm not saying it's unnecessary. I'm just saying that oftentimes this council gets bogged down in minutia that most of us do not understand. And the thing is with AMI, that was a conversation that night that was primarily occurring between you and staff. And so I missed the comment was my point 
of racial insensitivity. That was my only point. I'm not saying that it's boring, we shouldn't address it. I'm just saying that when this council gets fixated, certain members of this council get fixated on, and it happened again tonight when we were talking about um, an, issue, an issue, we all kind of just start following a certain path and a lot of us just our eyes glaze over. And so uh, um, what I- what boredom? What? And that's not boredom? No, that's that's a lot of times that uh, we are like we are talking about topics that um, what my, my job as mayor is to get us out of here by 11 and to make sure that we are conducting the people's business. And, and Polly, you're shaking your head. You know, you shake your head a lot. And so I, I appreciate your 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 thoughts. But my point is, I just try to move us along. And when one specific council member gets stuck, I try to get us off the mark. People might not like it, but they we either either do what I say or else you continue to discuss, and that's okay either way. But uh, I don't think I don't want to. One particular council member had some very important points to make that spoke directly to the concerns that were raised by the public. That is whether a delay in installing our AMI system would be a good thing whether in fact the AMI system is dangerous or whether it was safe. And I think that it was necessary to prove that by showing the public how well the different speakers could answer questions. And, and you'll notice that I did not say anything that night. I'm just saying that my eyes glazed over a little bit. They were talking about high technology topics that I don't have a background in and uh, was letting you do your thing. And therefore, I missed the racially insensitive topic was my point. I didn't say it was boring. I didn't say it was unnecessary. But I guess what I would like to say uh, with my time tonight is just uh, we have an election coming up on Tuesday night. And I would encourage everybody to um, be, be calm. Um, I know there's a lot of anxiety. Um, there has been a lot of anxiety since the last election. And regardless of what happens, who wins, this is the United States of America. This is Longmont, Colorado. And uh, if your person doesn't win, guess what? Um, we, have, we have been able to deal with this in 1776. And this election is, will be the same. So if your person doesn't win, uh, vocalize, but uh, be civil. Protest, but be civil. And uh, uh, do, do, do whatever you're gonna do. But if your guy doesn't win, um, don't, don't break and burn things. I guess that's, that's my only request. I don't care what side you're on. So, all right, Harold, anything? I'm um, no mayor. The only thing I wanted to say based on the item that councilman, council member, uh, Hidalgo Ferry brought up, um, we as staff, David Hornbacker did reach out to the individual and, and have a conversation regarding those comments. So, um, we also approach it in that direction too. So, and I think did it the very next day or the day after. So I just wanted you to know that we also did that as well. Cool. Thanks, Harold. Anything else? No comments. Eugene May. No comments, Mayor. Oh, that's pretty good. All right. Can we have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? I move that we adjourn the meeting. Second. Council member Christensen seconds it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. All right. The motion carries unanimously. Love you, Marsha. All right. Bye. Then pretend to be interested. I'll pretend. I'll pretend. <laughs>